one wants to do council session to order. It's a regular session. Can you please start with the roll call? Good evening, Mayor. Uh, Good Mayor evening. Bagley. Here. Council members Christensen. She's here. She's I here. See I see her. Council member Edalgo Faring. Here. Here. Council member Martin. Here. Council member Peck. Here. Council member Rodriguez. Here. And council member Waters. Here. Mary of a quorum. All right, great. All right, let's go ahead and say the pledge. Uh, who would like to start us out tonight? Aaron, why don't you start us with the pledge, buddy? See how hard it is going first. I did that last week. Oh, that's true. All right, let's go ahead then. <laughs> All right. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States, United States of, America, of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, 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 all right, just a quick reminder, anyone wishing to speak during first call, public invited to be heard, uh, will need to watch the live stream of the meeting and the instructions for how to call in to provide comment will be given during the meeting and displayed on the screen at the appropriate times during the meeting. Comments are limited to three minutes per person and each speaker will be asked to state their name and address for the record prior to proceeding with your comments. So let's go ahead and approve the minutes of May 5th, 2020. Do we have a motion? I'll move, all right, Councilmember Peck. All right, Councilmember Peck, is that a motion? All right, Councilmember Peck, Second. through head through head nods, has moved uh, approval of the May fifth, twenty twenty regular session City Council minutes. So uh, moved. Okay, I'll move second. it, and Councilmember Peck will second it. All right, great. All right, all in favor, say aye. 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 Say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. Do we have a motion to approve the minutes of May twelfth, twenty twenty? So moved. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez and seconded by Council Member Christensen. Seeing that there's no further discussion or debate, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, the motion carries unanimously. All right, Council Member Peck, it sounds like you have a motion to make, but are there also other motions that anybody has? All right, Council yes, Member I have. Peck. Okay, let's go with Council Member Peck first and then we'll go with you, Council Member Christensen. Is that okay? All right, Joan, floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this isn't a particularly uh, easy motion to make. Um, and in no way do I cast uh, aspersions on the kids and parents who built the BMX trail on the riparian area at Left Hand Creek. Uh, my motion is about the code and the ordinance, which is law to stay on the designated trail. Um, so Susan, can you put up the sign? This is uh, for the parents, the people watching. This is only one sign that is on that uh, left-hand creek. There's another one behind it that actually has the uh, municipal code on it. So um, whether or not a person agrees with this ordinance or, or code, we still have to comply with it. And there is a process if you wanna change it. So therefore I move to direct staff to reverse the decision to leave the BMX trail on Left Hand Creek open through the summer per municipal code 13.20.020.8. This motion is also a directive to the kids and parents who built the BMX trail through restorative justice to meet with city staff for education on codes, ordinances, the process to change laws and a plan to work with city staff to locate a site and the possibility of building a trail within the city of Longmont. Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded by council member Martin. Any, this is just to come back for discussion at a future meeting. We're not, not making a decision tonight. Um, any further discussion? Uh, um, Ma Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bagley. When we do bring this back for discussion, there's two things I would like to see. One, that the restorative justice be specifically for those who can't uh, uphold or follow the municipal code, as in any future violators, if you will. 
would, would be subject to municipal code, not retroactive to anybody that may have expressed opinions on it. And that also we be specific about uh, working for a future trail in the same part of town, not just any other part of town. Because Thank obviously you. we've seen a, a need in this part of town specifically. Thank you. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I, I would like to emphasize as uh, Council Member Peck said that this isn't uh, to punish kids who just wanna have fun and are being very creative. It's to help them work with city staff to do exactly that. Um, and city staff has done this before. Um, if we can find, um, as Council Member Rodriguez said, if we can find uh, a place that they can use in their own neighborhood, that would of course be preferable, but we already do have three bike parks. And um, if they, it seems from their comments that they found them uh, less than desirable. So if they work with city staff, uh, everybody will learn something. And um, that's what I would like to see too, is work, uh, have this, the kids who are very energetic, uh, work with city staff to try to improve the bike parks we already have, and, but also work with restorative justice because two acres and $10,000 worth of damage is, is a lot for the city. And, um, you know, we have to balance everybody's interests and nobody wants to stop kids from having fun. Bikes are freedom, but we have to balance the interests of the city. That's our job. And we have to also have to uphold the law. That's our job. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. So um, the whole point of restorative justice is that I know that when when a law is broken, there is some uh, there is some disciplinary action, and I, I I specifically don't want to necessarily slap the hands of parents or kids on this, but to actually educate them with through uh, restorative justice so that we don't start setting precedents that wherever there's a sign that says stay on the trail or this is off limits that uh, people start ignoring that. We need to, we need to pay attention. And uh, that is my hope with the restorative justice part. All right, I, don't, I guess, I guess, I guess well, I'm gonna vote against it. Um, I, here, my thoughts are that again, uh, we are allegedly in the midst of a pandemic that is uh, world changing and designating city resources to uh, deal with this particular issue at this time, I think is wholly inappropriate. Um, I think that waiting till the fall would be just fine, which is what we've already decided and what we've already talked about doing. Um, did we take a vote on this before? We didn't vote, yeah. right? Yeah. So, but we, we discussed it and that's what, that's what city staff had suggested. Um, having a 13, 14 and 16 year old uh, group of teenage boys, um, oftentimes we talk about how hard this uh, quarantine slash safe shelter at home issue has been for adults. Um, our kids, as so often is the case, I think it's lost in all this. They're dealing with depression. They're dealing with things to do that or not having things to do. They're stuck inside playing Fortnite and Xbox and arguing with their parents and not seeing their friends. And it's, it's, it's bad. It's a bad time for everybody. And so, yes, I agree that this shouldn't have been built there, but it's been there for a while and I would question the timing. And then, but that's just my opinion, but I also vehemently object to a city council anywhere, in this case ours, dictating to the city manager or the chief of police how they should enforce a law. I think it's inappropriate. Um, if someone breaks the law, it's up to the city. It's, it's up to it's up to the chief of police and and how they they go about enforcing it. Whether they press charges, whether they do restorative justice. Um, I don't think city council should have anything to do with how how Chief Butler decides to move forward with this. All right, Councilmember uh, Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, just to unclear. Uh, all we're voting on is to bring something back, right? Mm -hmm. What happens, yes or no, on restorative justice, and however much guidance there is, and what the timing is, 
all would be determined when this comes back on an agenda. Yeah, we're not debating anything other than bring this back for consideration. Is that true? Sure. Is that true? Uh -huh. Okay, so all that can be decided, right? So the speechifying and the and the rationale we're going to hear again, uh, but that it's when it's on the agenda is when I would think uh, we'd want to be drilling down on the issues. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say nay. Nay. All right, the motion uh, carries six to one with myself dissenting. All right, Councilmember Christensen. Um, I want to bring up something that um, was, uh, we have talked about for several years. I've been unhappy with for, <laughs> since I've been on council. Uh, Councilman Waters was very unhappy with it uh, since he started. And this has to do with the way council deals with board and commission interviews. I think we need to have a Saturday discussion for an hour and just sit down and discuss what we would like. What we cannot do is simply ignore it and not come because our job is to come to city council meetings and do all the things that city council members are supposed to do. But we do need to have a far more organized um, methodology as Councilman Waters has talked about and as I have talked about, we need to codify some questions that we ask each candidate for the same position uh, just as is usually done in any kind of hiring process. Granted, these are, these are um, volunteers serving on boards, but nevertheless, they do work and they, are, uh, they should be treated with respect, but they also need to be, ha have a fair process so everyone's getting the same question. And then we need to afterwards be able to sit down and talk briefly about um, our opinions rather than just show up um, at city council uh, four weeks after we've interviewed them and vote on something. That's, that isn't the way normal people hire people or choose people. And um, I just think we should, we should have that discussion for an hour or an hour and a half. Let's limit it, otherwise we'll go on and on and on and on. Just have a discussion. Saturday morning, coffee and donuts, and hash out what we want. Uh, because um, what Councilman Waters says is exactly right. We this is not uh, this is not a normal hiring process. And when I was at CU, we did this any number of times to hire people, and and we've all been hired, and we never went through this. So. Um, I think we need to have a discussion about how to evaluate it. So I would move that we have a Saturday morning discussion of no longer than one and a half hours on uh, discussing the protocol for um, uh, board and commission interviews. Do I have a second? Second, and I have a remark. Okay. All right. Just real quick, Harold, is this currently set for a city council agenda? Because I know I asked it to be put on the agenda. And if so, when? Don, can you come in on that one? I know it is. I just didn't know when. Mayor Bagley, we were going to put that on the 6-2 agenda. So next Tuesday, next week. Right. Um, I personally would rather just get it done on Tuesday rather than wait, um, especially since staff has managed to squeeze it into our regular time rather than a Saturday. But I'm only one. Council Member Martin. Yes, thank you, Mayor Bagley. Uh, this would work on a Saturday meeting. Uh, this suggestion I'm about to make would work on a Saturday meeting, but not necessarily on um, uh, at a council meeting, a regular council meeting. I was wondering if we could ask the um, the chairman or uh, you know someone from each board to comment on the process and. Uh, Let's hear their suggestions. Does that need any. to be? Does that need to be a a, a, a motion and amended to amend it, or something? I mean, if you want us to do something, it needs to be a motion. But right now, there's All a right. motion on. There's a right, currently there's a motion on the floor. 
and your motion would be to amend the motion. Yes. So I would if, like to ask uh, Council Member Christensen if she would consider that a friendly amendment. Um, I would. I would consider uh, asking them. However, remember, these are advisory boards to provide public oversight of most of these uh, boards. And so we don't want the advisory board to be choosing the advisory board. But I, I think that's a very good suggestion, Councilman Martin, because um, they've seen things come and go. And um, I think all of them could offer helpful, helpful suggestions. So I would consider that a friendly thing. And there isn't a uh, rush on this. Um, I do think it would be better because uh, to for us to each come with the board that we are the liaison with, with some suggested questions. Um, that way we have some stuff um, already there rather than to try to sit down and from scratch off the top of our heads, try to rehash this stuff, which I think we've tried to do before a little bit and that doesn't work very well. So um, yes, I think that's a good suggestion. So we can send out, um, I'm not sure how we would word that, just say to the um, heads of these boards and commissions, we are considering redoing, uh, re we are in the process of rethinking our um, and analyzing our protocol for how we select boards and commission uh, members, and we would like any input you have. It's okay, do you sync at that one? Yeah, because she doesn't need to because okay. she, she, it was her friendly. Because it's amendment. friendly. She was, okay. yeah, there you go. Dr. Waters? Okay. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. So does Councilmember Martin's amendment need a second? Her, no. No. Uh, so it's no secret um, how I, you know, what my feelings are about this because I've expressed it to council members. Um, here's the, here's the, uh, and I'm, and I'm down with a Saturday morning meeting. I, if it's an hour and a half, we're going to put an hour and a half time limit on it. I don't know how you get, how do you squeeze 22 board and commission members into the conversation? You, it, it, now it creates an issue for if it's going to be this Saturday, in the next 48 hours for, so it's not this Saturday. Okay, well then we ought to be clear on what Saturday, I guess. Um, okay, but it's gonna, Saturdays from now. If, if you're going to put 22 board of commission members into that conversation, it's going to be a it's going to be a long session. Now that said, um, I guess for me, uh, whether or not it's a Saturday session or a Tuesday evening section session for me, uh, the criteria would be which is more likely to enjoy some public scrutiny where applicants for these positions might be likely to tune in and listen to our conversation. And I'm guessing that Tuesday, not that we have a huge audience on Tuesday nights, but my guess is they're more likely to do it on a Tuesday night than on a Saturday to spend hours on a Saturday. But I do think we owe it to the applicants for them to hear the conversation, to know what's expected, what, what they could expect of us, what kind of standard we're going to hold ourselves to, the criteria in the protocol we're going to use, especially if it's virtual interviews, um, and that that should enjoy as much scrutiny of applicants as they would like to bring to it. And so the question is that more likely Saturday or Tuesday? And then, you know, how much time are we willing to, to spend listening uh, to input? I, I, I'm certain it would be rich and in, in valuable input. Um, we don't have very many options here. And, and I, I'm, for me, it's not a big puzzle about what I think we need to do to raise the standard and approach this in a way that, that demonstrates the respect for the people applying and the work that they do in the boards on which they serve, um, that what we do honors that. And I think how we approach this should reflect that respect for that process. And I don't think it's a big question about what that means for us. So I'm just, what I'm saying is whenever we do this is fine, I think Tuesday night would make more sense than Saturday morning, especially if we're going to spend a half a day in it, which we likely would with uh, 22 boarding commission members participating. Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. 
I'd like to tweak Marsha's amendment just a bit because uh, Councilman Waters uh, suggestion made a lot of sense about uh, would the boards even be interested in doing this? So how about if we as liaisons contacted the chairs of the boards we're on and asked them to write, to send us rather than appear in person, send us their list of what they would see like to see in a uh, in a liaison or a board member. I mean, not a liaison, because I bet you will see duplications, and that many people would uh, of different boards would would want the same things. All right. All right. So the chair, let's, let's let's do this. Let's break out the two. It's just officially got a little too complicated. Issue number one is we're going to meet on Tuesday or Saturday. We'll vote on that, and if it passes, then we'll talk about who we invite and how whether it be written or oral, if that's okay. So let's just vote real quick. Anybody have any additional comments on Tuesday versus Saturday? Council Member Christensen? Uh, I, I would prefer Saturday because this is really straightening out protocol that has to do with this city council board and how we do things. It has, it, it'll be a public meeting, of course, and it'll be on Zoom, but I don't think we really need to take up um, public, you know, the, the entire city's time talking about things that really have to do with the six of the seven of us. Um, I think it needs to be a separate meeting on a Saturday. And that way it will also be limited in time. And my it, idea is not to have every single person discuss from every single board, discuss what they want to see in a in an advisory board. As I said, these are to oversee these, these city uh, entities, not to create little groups of cronies. Um, so I'm not interested in them talking about what they wanna see in a board member. I'm interested in them commenting upon our process of selecting them. Okay. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I guess I could see either way, the initial hash out of details and procedure amongst us as colleagues could take a while. But I do think that regardless of whether we do that hash out on a, a Saturday or we hash it out on a Tuesday night, that we do have to on a Tuesday night, bring forward for clarity for our applicants, whatever the final decision is of those details. And so we feel it more appropriate to spend that amount of time hashing out the details on a Saturday, we're still going to bring on Tuesday the final results of, of that, that uh, you know, uh, determination of procedure. And so I'm not really, I guess, set on one Saturday or Tuesday, but either way, it's going to take a while, but still on a Tuesday, we need to present the results. Council Member Martin? I think uh, the Mayor Pro Tem has a good suggestion. We, ha we will put our decision in the form of a resolution, henceforth, this is the new process, but we shouldn't make the public who likes to watch on a Tuesday night sit through the whole thing. And that's why I preserve, <laughs> prefer Saturday. I guess to me, it's just, uh, I mean, if we've got the time on Tuesday, it's, uh, I don't know about you guys, but I spend a hell of a lot of, a lot of time doing this job. And I'd rather just do it on a Tuesday night rather than give up another Saturday morning. But anyway, let's vote on it. We have a vote that says uh, we do this on a Saturday, limiting it. What? Mayor, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. There you are down there. Sorry. You got to move, Doc. Got to move. Councilmember Waters. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so we ought to be clear about what Saturday. Because uh, because I cause honestly, I, I do have some obligations uh, coming up, oddly, in this time of safe at home. Um, so, uh, if it's Saturday, June 6th, there are times on that particular Saturday, I am already obligated and, uh, would have to work around that. I mean, I, it's, uh, it's something that I'm committed to doing. Uh, and I, under most circumstances, I would rearrange that for this, but that happens to be something I can't rearrange. So let's be clear about which day we're talking about. Is there a Saturday, Don, that's clear? 
Mayor, I think um, we don't have much scheduled for the same reasons. Things right. are, are canceled. Yeah, what, and I just had a question about who seconded that, if you. All right, what about the 13th, Don? It looks clear to me, everybody, I would double check. Everybody okay with the 13th? I'm just counting votes here. I see hands going up, I know, but we're, I'm counting votes. And Councilmember Christensen? Yeah, I think the 13th is fine. And that will way everybody right now needs to start writing a letter asking uh, the boards that they're the liaison on to um, comment upon our procedure. Okay. And we should have, then we should have those answers back by the 13th and they should be writing them to all of us. Okay. So that we all have the same information. All right. Anybody here have a conflict on the 13th? All right. So that's not part of the motion, but we'll go ahead and make it the 13th. The motion is we can do this on a Saturday instead of a Tuesday. And it sounds like we're going to set it for the 13th. So all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. All right. <laughs> motion. Motion carries six to one with Mayor Bagley, uh, the lone dissenter. Council Mayor Christensen? Uh, how about if we have it uh, around 930 in the morning so it's not too late, and it's not too hot? Uh, we'll, we'll, let, let, we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Uh, 930, 10 o'clock. I mean, that's not not too bad for me. So anyway. All right. Um, other uh, then uh, what was the other thing? Ah, yes. And then um, it sounds like uh, it sounds like we might just be emailing and asking our chair people and staff members to uh, give us their input on what they think. Is that we all is there a consensus on that rather than inviting them to the meeting? And if they are to attend, that's fine. But they're just going to listen. All right. Okay, we have consensus, unanimous consensus on that, Don. So if we could, um, uh, and I guess instead of us, could we have the city, I mean, I guess it would be easier for Don to go ahead and just send out an email requesting their input? Councilmember Christensen? I think it would be better if we had one consistent question, uh, just briefly. That's what because I mean. that way it would actually get done. It would get done on time because we can count on city staff to do it on time. And it would all also be the same language instead of each one of us sending out different language. Is that, is that okay with you, Don? Would you accept that to ask? Could you do that for us? I will. I just want to make sure I'm getting the right person. So you want that to go to the board chair, not the staff liaison. Do we want the Your staff liaison? board chair. Maybe copy the staff write it to the, to the chair and then copy the staff liaison maybe? I can absolutely do that. All right, anybody Just opposed to that idea? Right All right, that's got, we've got consensus. All right, any other agenda revisions? All right, great. City manager, do you have a report? I assume you do. I do have a, a report today on changes that have occurred. Um, I also have Jeff Zayak. Here with us tonight and so Jeff is going to give you all um, a presentation uh, regarding um, what they're doing Boulder County Health and some numbers. Jeff are you online? Yep. Jeff can you unmute yourself? Gotcha. All right now I should be good. All right just tell me uh, Jeff's going to start out and go over his information and then I'll cover a couple of points. Jeff just tell me when you want me to change slides. Sounds good. Thank you, Mayor and Council members. Uh, appreciate being invited back. Uh, and here, I'll just leave it on this one for a little bit. I'll probably stay here for about five minutes. Um, in, in terms of tonight, what I wanted to do is a couple things. Just provide an overview of county trends and what we're seeing uh, in our data uh, so that you Jeff, can see. Yeah. Excuse me, one minute. Sure. We're not seeing anything. Uh, All right. Thank you. Okay, great. And again, you can just leave it there for, for, a, sec for a second, Harold. Um, but what I wanna do is go over county trends and show you the data that we've been tracking and then talk about, just do a brief update on the orders themselves and what's changed. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll uh, just wanna make sure that everybody is aware of these high level trends. So we are continuing to see very positive trends. Um, overall, we're seeing decreasing cases in the county right now. 
Uh, and as testing continues, we do expect um, that cases will increase. We, we have not yet significantly expanded our testing, um, but we do have a community-wide testing plan. We've been able to get some, uh, some tests and test supplies. So we expect that that testing will start to, to expand as we move into the next couple of weeks. And when we do that, we'll expect to see some increases in cases. Um, we are continuing to see decreasing COVID-19 hospitalizations, and our hospitals still continue to have great capacity for surgeability um, and certainly can meet all the current needs that they have. And I'll go over a couple slides um, once we get into that that demonstrates that as well. Um, as I had noted, testing capacity is slowly increasing. Appreciate we've been working with Salud, uh, UC Health, uh, Longs Peak is doing community-wide testing, and we are really appreciative of the efforts that those folks are putting in place. And we do have some urgent cares as well doing some community-wide testing as well. Uh, so again, from the data standpoint, we're really looking pretty good. And I'll go through, again, some of those slides in just a second. Until, uh, just a reminder, until we have a vaccine or a widely available treatment, we're going to continue to stress the need for the social distancing and face coverings where it's hard to maintain that social distancing. Um, and I would so much appreciate it and Longmont's have been great, but just continuing to share that focus and messaging. I know you all have been working with our um, public information officer really closely. I appreciate that. Um, and that's gonna help us uh, make sure that we can continue to build back our businesses and our economy um, and do that in a way that keeps people safe. Uh, the worst things that we can do is to have large gatherings, um, not follow social distancing. Um, and we saw an example of that with what happened uh, at Boulder Creek uh, a little over a week ago. That We don't want to do that, obviously. That, that, again, puts our society, our economy, and our businesses, as well as our most vulnerable people in our community at risk. So that's the kind of thing that we definitely want to stay away from. And we have to remember, too, that not everybody shows symptoms of this disease. So we could have people that are in a gathering like that who are positive, who could spread the disease. That could be spread to somebody who is more at risk and they end up having symptoms and exposing other folks. So um, it's important to really focus on that social distancing. Um, and it's definitely up to every one of us uh, to, to continue to, to push that and keep our economy and our, and our society moving in the right direction. So I appreciate all the support for that as we continue into these next weeks. And then just a quick update on a couple orders. So the Board of Health approved an extension of our existing uh, county face covering order that expires actually this evening. Um, and we're extending that to June 30th. And we conducted a survey of uh, 375 of our businesses, gathered feedback on the face covering order to gauge the level of support we were seeing from businesses and what they were seeing uh, on the ground in their businesses relative to social distancing and people wearing face coverings. Um, so that was really helpful for us to see. We also conducted a Sentinel survey where we had staff that went out and observed compliance with masks and social distancing in grocery stores and other retail establishments. Um, and we also asked all of our law enforcement partners about what they were seeing from a qualitative standpoint. So those were really the three things that we've done moving into making that decision of extending the order. Um, we definitely, in general, saw less. Um, there was still challenges with finding social distancing happening, especially in areas um, of stores where it was crowded um, or where there was difficulty maintaining that distance when they were going let's say through a narrow aisle or something like that. So we definitely did though see a really great adherence to mask wearing, much higher than we had expected. Um, so I so much appreciate uh, those of you who are, who are uh, tuned in here tonight watching this. Thank you for, um, for following through on wearing the mask, especially where it's difficult to maintain that social distancing of six feet and continue to focus on uh, again, finding the ability to, to maintain six feet of social distancing uh, is an important thing to do as we move forward, because if we can do that, then the disease can't spread. So, uh, so again, want to thank folks um, who, are, who are continuing to support that. Uh, the, the last order I wanted to just give a quick update on um, is the governor's uh, order, and he issued an executive order 
um, which is not an actual update to the public health order yet, which we expect to happen by June 1st. Um, but he, ex he extended an executive order that basically made announcements yesterday that were related to restaurants, summer camps and camping. Um, and we know that our restaurant guidance is out. So restaurants are, have been encouraged to work with each of our municipalities and towns to try to create uh, more ability to use outside areas as an example, to cry, try to create more social distancing so that restaurants can continue to, uh, to, to open up and that there is adequate distance uh, to keep it safe for their patrons. So just wanted to share that. Also summer camps and camping um, were included in the executive order and again, we, ex we expect that the state will actually issue revised orders um, around the, the current safer at home order and that we're expecting to see that um, prior to June 1st, which is when uh, the existing order uh, is gonna expire itself. Um, so I'm gonna go now, Harold, to the slides. Uh, if you wanna go to the first slide and I'm gonna, I'll clip through these fairly quickly, um, but I did want to illustrate just the data that we're seeing because it's very positive and we want to obviously keep this trend going. Just this, this is a quick one. Total case count in Boulder County at this point is 923 people. Um, 61 of those folks have deceased. Unfortunately, every, every death is really difficult, especially for the people that are related and the families associated with those. And again, the majority um, of those deaths uh, are in our long-term care facilities at just a little bit less than 80%. Um, as I've shared with all of you before, we have liaisons working with every single facility to continue to support them uh, as we move forward into these months ahead. Next slide. Uh, this just shows the total number of new cases per day. And the orange bars represent our long-term care facility cases. Um, so a couple things to note here. Again, our general trend was up and then is starting to tail down. The, the sampling or the, the number of cases that you're seeing on the 22nd of May, there is a spike there. And that's because our long-term care facility, um, one of our long-term care facilities was tested. So there was a significant amount of testing that occurred at that facility. There was, um, as, as would be expected, we identified more positives at the facility and that's why there is a spike on that one day. And um, the, the majority of those cases actually came directly from that facility. But in general, downward trend with new cases per day. Again, um, as we test, we expect that we will see more positives. Um, and that's actually what we do wanna see because when we know and have identified folks that are positive, we can then help support and make sure that we're isolating, quarantining people, um, and then supporting them uh, in those in that isolation and quarantine and preventing the spread of further disease in the community. So testing and increased cases um, is not necessarily a bad thing when it's associated with testing directly. Next slide. This is just the five-day average uh, for the general trend. So you can again see um, that we've peaked and we are coming back down. Next slide. This is um, the number of people who have tested positive or are considered probable um, or who have deceased by race and Hispanic origin. And the unfortunate thing that we're seeing here is we continue to see a high impact in our Latinx population. We know that many of those folks are our essential workers. Um, they're out on the front lines and have been throughout this entire, uh, this entire COVID disease process. And they are bearing the brunt of the impacts of this. So we are having conversations both um, within Boulder County and within the state to, to develop strategies to help reverse these type of impacts, which we know are significant. And we're, we're seeing definitely higher, uh, higher, not just higher impacts in people's, uh, the number of COVID cases in this category, um, but we do not wanna see increased deaths in this, this category as well. So we're continuing to focus on that. Next slide. This is the, the, the number of residents who've tested pos or positive and it's by municipality and it's per 100,000 population. So um, there is, Longmont has a high number here as I know you can all see. And I did a little bit of digging in because I thought you might have questions about this before I came to the meeting tonight. And what I found out from our epidemiologists is that several things are driving this. Um, number one, um, as I just said, we know we have a higher impact in the Latinx population. Um, we're seeing 
a, a fair amount of, of household spread that's occurring. So we have in long multi-generational families, um, there's lots of household members in those families. And when somebody get, is positive and they're back in their household, it's really difficult to control the spread of the disease in those uh, types of scenarios. And we're seeing a lot of spread happen in that, that type of scenario. The other places that we're seeing spread is long-term care facilities. Sorry, my phone is ringing in the background there. Um, and I, I didn't have a chance to break that data out um, by Longmont specifically, but I'm happy to do that and send it as a follow-up to council members uh, and to, to Harold. We also, as I think you're all aware, saw uh, an outbreak in the Walmart um, in Weld County uh, that has impacted some Longmont residents, as well as in Cir Circle Graphics. Those are the places that we've seen um, specific outbreaks between long-term care facilities at Walmart and Circle Graphics are really where we've seen uh, some more of the outbreaks happening. And I wanna give Salud a big thank you here um, because they're, they're really doing a great job at providing testing and making the testing accessible to our uh, Spanish speaking community. And we're able to identify and support uh, the folks in that community. And Salud has done a great job uh, really focused on that. So uh, next slide. Um, this slide just demonstrates where the impacts are uh, in terms of the total number of people who have tested positive for COVID-19 or are probable by age. And although it impacts a lot of people in multiple age categories, the, the orange that you're seeing on the, on the graph itself is the actual um, deaths that we're seeing. And you can see that the highest number of impacts continue to be on our, uh, on our older population that has underlying conditions. So we're continuing to see those impacts in those populations, hence um, the fact that we have a high uh, death rate in long-term care facilities. Next. Uh, this, is our, this is our testing results for Boulder County um, and it's total tests per day. And again, on the, the 21st there or so, there's that big uh, spike. It was actually Thursday of last week. Um, there's a big spike in the total number of tests. That is because of the tests that were done at that long-term care facility. Um, we've had a slow decline um, in tests per day. Part of that is because there are not tests that are offered every single day. So you see spikes throughout the graph and those are times when testing, community testing is made more available. Um, as I said before, we just received a large number of tests. We expect that those tests will go up in our community and that we'll continue to see um, some more positives associated with that. Next slide. This just shows the total hospitalizations for the Denver metro area. And Boulder is down here in the red line. We've made, remained really really uh, relatively flat for a long period of time here, which is great. That's exactly what we want to see. Um, and we the number is slightly ticking up. Um, that is partly because we have uh, hospitals now who are able to do elective surgeries as well. So this is total hospitalizations. And the next slide going forward, you'll see the total number of COVID hospitalizations in Boulder County. Um, and this is just for Boulder County specifically, but you can see that we've been on a downward trend um, for our hospitalizations. And this is exactly what we wanna see as we're moving forward is for this trend to continue and stay down. Uh, next slide. These next, this slide and the two that follow this are really just a demonstration of some of the things that we're tracking. Um, some of this data is available daily, some of it's available weekly. Um, but it's it's the type of data that we're tracking for all of our hospitals across Boulder County to make sure that we're in a good place, that our hospitals are in a good place in terms of the surge capacity. So this one right here is the number of medical and surgical beds that are available at Boulder County hospitals. Um, and as you can see, it's fairly consistent. Even though we've opened up um, more elective surgeries, we still have a positive trend uh, in, in Boulder County. Next slide. Uh, this one's a, a positive trend and has been. Um, number of ICU beds available at Boulder County Hospitals by date. And then the last one is the number of, of adult critical ventilators um, available for Boulder County Hospitals. And again, you can see that it's um, it dropped down for a little while, but has uh, been a slow and steady um, increase uh, since, since that point. So our hospitals, and we meet with our hospitals on a weekly basis. So we, we ground truth what you're seeing here. We make sure we talk with them. They tell us if they're having 
challenges or problems, we can look back and see if the data is, is accurate and if we're hearing something different from our hospitals, but our hospitals are really in a great place. And again, we continue to meet with them on a weekly basis. And I think that's my last slide. And I just wanted to, again, take the opportunity to share with you that the trends look good for Boulder County. Um, we wanna to continue to see those trends increase and it really does come down to each and every one of us and the folks who are listening to this following that social distancing guidance is really, really important. Um, the virus can't spread with, when, you're, when you're more than six feet apart from each other. And if we can continue to focus on that, we'll continue to move in the right direction. And that's all I have. All right, thank you very much. Any questions for Jeff before he leaves? Councilmember Waters. Jeff, uh, you may have said this and I missed it, um, or, or it, it's more likely going to be in the June first updates. Um, but any any uh, speculation or forecasting about pool, softball, baseball, other kinds of team sports when when there would be some movement in terms of what can happen and what the parameters would be. Uh, there, there you go, go, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, we have been asking about that over and over and over again because we're getting asked about it. Um, and what we are hearing from the state is that we will hear some of those things. We could hear some of them uh, in the June 1st order. And if we don't hear them in the June 1st order, we're hearing that it's going to be around mid May. Um, but those are the same questions that we have. We do have, just so you know how hard we're working on this, we have a group of regional attorneys that meet on a weekly basis. We meet with the AG's office involved and CDPHE legal staff to, to continue to press on these kinds of questions um, because there are questions that I know each and every one of you um, are hearing about locally in each of your municipalities. So um, we're pressing on it, but I don't know exactly when those answers will come. Jeff, you said uh, June 1st or, or mid-May. I think maybe you meant mid-June. Yes, I'm sorry. Right. Um, I did mean mid mid June, and the order will come out on June before June first. So okay. we know that will happen, but we may not have all the answers at that point. Thank you, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Badley. Jeff, thank you for that update. Um, can you give us any reasoning uh, for not opening up the team sports and and softball, the local, not the stadiums or the huge venues. Uh, thanks, and Harold, I won't mute myself again. Uh, so thank you for <laughs> releasing that. Um, That's fine. The, the, the reason being is that that is prohibited at this point uh, under the state order. So that is not our local order that prohibits that. We again have been, I think that may come um, in the June 1st order, um, but we have been asking about that as well. Uh, I know that's a big issue for both of our school districts and school districts across the front range. So that is a question that we have out to the state as well. So the the reason as to why it has not been updated is, is what? We, I, I we, guess I don't understand the reasoning behind that one particular sport. Have, yeah. have, am I missing something? Uh, no, I don't think so. And when you say that one particular sport, you mean Baseball. sports? Sorry, I, I'm sorry, can you say that again? Baseball locally. Okay. Uh, my understanding is from a, a team sport approach in general is the issue. So it's not just baseball, but it's baseball, soccer. It's um, any, any team sport where you're bringing a lot of people together and potentially having close contact or even contact with people around that type of thing. So I, that's my understanding from the state is that their, and their concern is obviously that they don't want this they want to open things slowly and they want to don't want to move things too quickly because we none of us, I know none of us on this call, uh, none of us across the state want to go backwards. Um, so they want to make sure they're taking things slowly um, and measured. Um, and, and I think, I believe that's the main reason why they've held back okay. on this. Thank you. Well, I, I just, so I guess what I'm hearing is, I guess Mike, so we're still, our hospitals still remain clear, right? Yes. Ventilators, ICU beds, right? Did our hospitals here locally in Boulder County ever get overburdened? See a wave of of COVID patients that that threatened to overrun capacity? 
The only time there was a concern was when our long-term care facilities were starting to see a surge and the reason for that, but no, we did not hit, we never hit a point where we had to go to critical care standards as an example. Um, that would have been an, an issue that was where you're clearly in a surge. I right. mean, um, the, only, the only challenge they had um, from a hospital standpoint was the concern that with so many long-term care facility people being hospitalized, they're typically on vents longer, they're in the hospital for a much longer period of time. Um, and they were worried about that, but we never did hit a critical care uh, approach. So we did not hit a surge. Right. And then another question, I guess I had, we've had 61 deaths, 80% happening in long care and care facilities, which would mean that 12 or 13 were not in long-term care facilities, right? That's correct. Okay. So I guess my question is, what, what uh, were they practicing social distancing, masks, et cetera, in these facilities? Do you know? Yes, they are. Um, and part of the challenge is early on, some of these facilities, some of the disease got into these facilities early on before we knew as much about the disease as we know now. And once it was in the facilities, it's really difficult to control, which is why you see the state now saying they're going to they're going to test all the asymptomatic facilities, largest to smallest, because they want to prevent it from getting in the facility itself. And that's actually why they passed that. The governor passed that order at the end of May to, or I'm sorry, the, uh, the end of April to require long-term care facilities to make sure that they can isolate patients um, because it's so difficult once it's in there to stop it from spreading. Okay. They That's do have, they do wear masks. They are a long-term care facilities have worked really hard um, to try to, to try to control the spread. None of them obviously uh, want to see this happen. Okay. All right. Councilor Martin. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I wanted to know, uh, in terms of, of the hospitals never having exceeded capacity, uh, would that have been true if we had not uh, deferred elective surgeries and, and other non-critical admissions, or um, were, were we home free and we could have kept doing business as usual? We would have been, so if you look back at, we have a little dashboard indicator um, that's not the graphs I showed you, but it's like a little dial that shows red, yellow, green. If we had got, if we had elective surgeries in place, plus we had the COVID and we were at the end of the flu season um, when this started, we probably would have pushed some of those indicators into the red area. Um, and it would have been, but I don't think we would have hit a surge. I haven't evaluated that data to see if that would happen, but we were on the verge. We had a, we had a few that were yellow and close to the red at times. And I think if we had elective surgeries happening, plus that happening, we would have been closer, but I don't know that we would have been in a surge that we would have had to move to critical care standards on. All right, Jeff, thank you so much. You do good work. We appreciate all your work and effort. And uh, I wouldn't have wanted your job over the last two or three months. So you're handling it like champ. We appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mary. I appreciate all of you. And thank you, council members. All right. All right. Let's yeah, we're good. We're good Carol, to go. Do you have anything else? I do. All right. Um, so as you know, um, the governor has released some new orders um, and, and we've been working on those. The, um, the one thing I do want to say to council is, um, and, and again, reiterate, as you see, when you saw us coming into this and they were issuing orders and they were sent and we were saying it's changing constantly. Um, what I will tell you unequivocally that it is even harder now in terms of these orders and, and how they're removing them just because of the nuances in each one of these orders and the work that we have to do to truly understand what it means and communicate those and making sure that we're following. So we're really in one of those situations where coming out of the processes is, 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 is harder and more time consuming than it was when we moved into the, to the process and we're moving through these things. So the two big things that actually came out tonight are, over the weekend and then was uh, the governor talked about was restaurants and then summer camps. I want to talk a little bit about restaurants and what we're doing just to um, get some feedback from council. So one of the things uh, that we've been working on with our, our economic development business group that you all have met is really working through um, and, and taking the lead from the governor in terms of how do we work with restaurants to make um, spaces available for them to use so they can actually add capacity um, to their seating areas because it's been reduced by 50 percent. 
And so generally you have two issues that are coming into play. Uh, one is um, just the restaurant itself and seating capacity. And we've worked with, um, and this gives you a sense of how many people have to get involved. Um, we had municipal court and the liquor authority, city clerk's office, planning and development services, legal, my office, um, and then a few others trying to tease through um, and really understand how can we move forward in this. So what you will see is take liquor completely out of it, is that if a restaurant needs to expand their business, and this is really um, speaking to areas that are near the public and you're gonna see most of it in the downtown area when they don't have a lot of parking lot space and some other room, um, we're gonna run them through um, the UOPP process for business expansion. And again, that's gonna be a temporary process that we're gonna use for folks uh, following the governor's orders. And Joni can run that through her, her office administratively. Now, if you're going to have to have a liquor permit extension into those areas, then you have to work with the municipal court judge and our liquor authority and Don in her office to move through that. And talking to the judge, we're gonna move through those because of what they've done with the Liquor Enforcement Division and waiving those hearing requirements. We've created a form where folks check off saying, we wanna waive that requirement and they're gonna look at those administratively. And the whole attempt at what we're trying to do is actually to move, our, move these businesses through the process as quickly as they can so that they can become operational um, and maximize their seating capacity while it's been reduced indoors by 50%. And so that's the direction that we're moving on. Um, if you're on a private property, so for example, um, Village of the Peaks or some of the other places, you have to have permission from the owner to expand. They don't have to go through the UOPP process, but if they go through the, extend, the expansion component in, in terms of the liquor laws, they have to show that they have the authorization of the property owner to expand in that area. And I forgot folks, we have police and fire involved in this too from a public safety perspective. So at this point, um, what we wanted to talk about and based on what we heard from the state, what the governor was saying in terms of working with folks um, that we, uh, we continue pressing forward to streamline this process to, uh, to the best of our ability. So that's what we're doing at this point as staff. I wanted to throw this out to you because again, it's moving quickly um, to see if you all had any questions regarding this process. All right, Councilmember Martin. Quick one, what's UOPP? Use of public places. Sorry, I'm stuck in acronym world these days. <laughs> Any questions or concern about the approach um, that we're talking about? Council Member Christensen. Um, Harold, I think this is a wonderful idea. Uh, it's really, as I think everybody knows, uh, restaurants operate on a very, very small profit margin. So when you tell them, well, you can open again, but you can only be at 50%, well, they can't even afford to open, really. <laughs> so if we can expand uh, their use of public space, that's really useful. And I just wanted to share, too, a little bit of what, you know, Louisville has these, um, they expand onto the sidewalk in the summertime. Mm -hmm. We've all been there, which is very cool and a very good community thing. Um, the way that arose, because one of the city council members who, the city council member who initiated that was up in uh, <clears throat> some mountain town and the restaurant was full. And there was a guy out in the parking lot who he just took his food outside to eat and he saw a pallet. And so, because the parking lot was muddy, so he flapped the pallet down and then he sat, grabbed a chair that was around and sat on it. And she thought, huh, we can do that. And so she got, people to contribute pallets. She got uh, Home Depot to give a reduced supply of lumber and that hardened it up and made it something suitable that you could also disassemble when there was no longer a need for it. Um, so um, I'm just thinking 
is the fastest we can get these things through and the most um, innovative use we can um, make of various resources is what we should be doing. And so thank you for, for doing all this. It's a lot of people to get together to expedite it, but it should help everybody. Thanks. And if I can be clear, I want to really give a big shout out to, um, you know, the D DDA and Kimberly, the Latino Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce, LADP, and all of those folks, because there's a lot of individuals and then the restaurant owners themselves in communicating with this. There's a lot of folks that have really come together quickly on this. And so I wanted to, to give a shout out to all of those folks doing a lot of hard work um, to move this through. All right. You have a... Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, Harold, I don't know if you are looking for suggestions or whatever, but I always have input. Um, downtown, um, would it be possible to use uh, the alleyscapes as well for extra seating? Because not only would that be attractive on those red bricks, but it, it would really expand it as well as the sidewalk out front. And um, in Harvest Junction, the, the uh, right angle parking that is, for example, up next to Pinocchio's and uh, Panera, they've got such huge parking lots there that are never really full. That if we could just take those first uh, right angle parkings next to the buildings um, for to Tokyo Joe's or, or even next to Tokyo Joe's and um, the coffee shop, Red Frog mm -hmm. is that huge space that right. really is never used. It would be an incredible e outside eating area forever. So um, just, I, I really appreciate what you're doing and any way we can expand this eating uh, restaurant capacity, I'm all in favor of. So great suggestion. So yes, we are looking at the alleyways um, and, in addition to the sidewalks, looking at parking, you know, is there the potential to use some of the parking lots in certain areas? It depends on what each individual location has. Um, and then working, you know, I want to reiterate working with, um, so the example that you used of Harvest Junction, working with the owners of those properties um, mm -hmm. to ensure that they can work with the, their tenants that have these businesses so that they can give them the necessary approvals they need so they can move through the process. It's in that case, it would only touch us from a liquor authority perspective, but they still need the approval of those property owners. Um, you know, this is first phase. We knew it was coming and we had to move quickly. Um, you know, there's some good ideas coming out and we have to engage in conversations with um, CDOT about, do we look at, you know, Main Street? You know, and this was really something Kimberly talked about. Um, can we look at Main Street, you know, certain days or a day on a weekend or something to where we could do that sort of like festival on Maine, but they can use that for capacity. So there's a lot of these ideas coming and I know we'll bring more to you all, but I wanted to bring this one to say, this is what we need to do now in order to facilitate their opening as quickly as possible um, to make sure you all were you know, in line with this as we were moving in this direction. Um, but definitely you'll be hearing other creative ideas coming forward. Great. Keep up the good work. Thanks. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on, you heard summer camps and we're starting to talk about this. To Jeff's point and some of your questions about what does this mean in terms of sports summer camps, those are questions that we fed in um, once again, um, based on the information that we've seen. Again, the nuance in the summer camp piece, um, if you've, um, I was on a call this afternoon, so if it's an indoor camp, it's 10 people, but if it's outdoor, it's 25 people. Um, and then we also, um, I talked to Karen about wanting to really find out via some type of survey mechanism to see how many parents would, would actually enroll their kids in a summer camp. We're seeing different trends right now in different communities. Uh, some are not wanting to do it and in other communities they are. So we really wanna understand what that's going to look like for us. And so to let you all know, we're, we're just plugging away at that to get more clarity and we'll be updating you on what that looks like for our community. Um, I had a couple of talking points. Um, Jeff covered them. Um, Jeff did a great job covering that information. I wanted to let you all know that um, Councilmember Hidalgo Faring 
We haven't forgot your presentation from Carmen, that's gonna be coming, but it actually is gonna be a good point because in my conversation this afternoon when we were going over the numbers, um, we went a little more in depth in terms of looking at Longmont's numbers and what that really looks like and why. And they're going to be breaking those down for us. And then we're actually going to create, I'm not saying create, we're going to enhance our partnership that we have with them now to really understand what's happening in those numbers so that we can be more targeted from a public information standpoint and a community involvement standpoint of which we're gonna be involving all of our cultural brokers in various aspects of the community once we start getting more detail. And so that's a follow-up for me and some of the others on our team in terms of really looking at that and what we're gonna do um, specifically related to those numbers. But the one thing that did come out in that meeting today was that while we look different in terms of numbers as a community, um, in the past weeks, we actually now are looking a lot like the other communities in terms of the numbers. So there has been a shift in our community. Um, but again, I think it's really managing social distancing, um, the face mask component. Um, I know we have the ability for me to extend that to Well County. I will tell you all we're evaluating it and watching it, but what I saw this weekend, at least what I'm hearing, um, is that our folks did really well. And so, if there's not a need to do it, I'm not gonna do it. But if I get different information um, from our folks at Union and Sandstone, then I will obviously need to make the, uh, the necessary decision on that. But right now it seems like everyone's really respecting that even in those areas. But if I hear more, then I'll take the appropriate action. All right, thanks Harold. Anything else? Any other questions for me? All right, nope, good job. Thank you. All right, let's go ahead and move on to first call public invited to be heard. And so let's go ahead, if you would like to speak at first call public invited to be heard, go ahead and uh, call in. Uh, the number is 669-900-6833. When prompted, enter the meeting idea that is currently being presented on the screen. And uh, make sure you mute your computer when you call in and then, uh, uh, yeah, just we're going to go ahead and take a five minute break and uh, we'll see who's in the queue. So, Council, let's go ahead and take a five minute break.
me? Can we get back on the computers and get going again? See Aaron. We'll wait for Aaron. Mayor, you're muted. All right, Aaron's back. All right, let's go ahead and do public invited to be heard. Uh, Susan, do you want to read off the phone numbers, please? Of course, Mayor. We've got, uh, looks like four guests this evening. So the first guest, I will be unmuting you. Your telephone ends in 637. Go ahead and give us your name and address before you begin. 637. Hi. You, hi. Yes. <laughs> hi. My name is Pearl Spinharney. And did you say my address? I'm sorry. Yes, please. My address is 1910 Spruce Avenue, Longmont, Colorado. Thank you. Go ahead. And I sent all of you um, letters in regards to what I'm calling in about tonight. Um, so good evening, council members. I'm calling in regards to short-term rentals within the city of Longmont, and I want to state my frustration in having one in my backyard as my backyard neighbor. I'm frustrated in having new guests every three or five days. It's been frustrating for my family and my neighbors, and I'm pleading for help in ending this in neighborhoods where it negatively impacts residents and homeowners. I'd like to have better restrictions and ability to enforce rules for these short-term rentals. What can you do to help this issue and help put rules in place to help this from happening in other community, in the community with other homeowners? Thank you. Thank you. For the record, that was textbook right there. All right, do you wanna go next? Yes, Mayor, the next caller, your telephone ends in 820. You've been unmuted. Do you hear us? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Please state your name and address for the record. Hello, my name is Catherine Baylog, and I live at 1920 Spruce Avenue. I'm calling in today for a plea for help. Back in March, the house behind us at 1883 Arapahoe was bought and at the end of April turned into a full-time Airbnb short-term rental property. The house sits on a hill above our backyard and has decks on the second and third story, which overlook our backyard and house. When the guests are in this backyard or up on the decks, they can see most of our backyard and our neighbor's backyard. When they speak, it becomes a stadium in our backyards where we hear everything that is said and it echoes. This has become a nightmare for my family and our neighboring, neighboring family whose backyard also backs up to this home's property. In this short time that the house has been rented out as a short-term rental property, things have happened that has, have made us feel violated, unsafe, and feel we have no privacy in our own backyards. Every time the guests are up on the decks, we can see them looking at us and on numerous occasions talking about us. 
On numerous occasions, as our children have played in our own backyards, they have been made fun of and taunted by children of different parties from the decks, making them feel extremely uncomfortable, which prompted them to get embarrassed enough to come inside. On numerous occasions, guests constant smoking cigarettes and pot have made our backyard air intolerable, which has forced us to go inside. On numerous occasions, there have been drunk, slurring, yelling guests all day and night up until midnight. On two different occasions, we have heard the guests say loudly, we're on vacation. We don't need to be quiet for the neighbors. We have wanted to call the police on many occasions, but are afraid that the drunk guests will retaliate and do something to our backyards. My husband and I have worked very hard, him as a firefighter and myself as a teacher at a local elementary school, to be able to afford our house, which we believe is our forever home. Having what we feel is a hotel in our backyard has made us emotionally upset, and we are considering selling our forever home so we don't have to deal with our lives being affected by this situation anymore. City Council, what would you rather have in Longmont? A family who works hard or, and very hard to be neighborly and takes pride in their home and community, or an investor whose sole purpose is to run a money-making hotel in the middle of our quiet community and does not care about the neighbors or the integrity of the community? I'm asking for your help. I am asking you to please reconsider the Airbnb laws in the city of Longmont. Airbnb was made for family sharing of a house. This house behind us, sole purpose is a money-making hotel. We don't live in a resort community. We live in the middle of a quiet neighborhood. Why is it that when I look around my street, everyone else's house is quiet and neighborly. And when I look out in my backyard, I have new, na- new people every week on vacation. Safety and noise levels. Would you please consider changing the rules so we do not have new neighbors every week that we don't know watching over our children and us, partying on their vacation, and help make our backyards and lives private and safe again? Please consider changing the laws so houses can only be rented out maybe once in a three-month period or something like like that. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. All right. Next. Mayor, next caller. Your number ends in 975. I'm going to unmute you. If you can please state your name. Do you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, My name is Thomas Stanring, and uh, I do also live in 1920 Spruce Avenue. Thank you. Uh, uh, I am uh, the husband of uh, Catherine, who just uh, talked to you, and I would like to uh, confirm what she has been uh, talking about, and I would just like to um, reiterate uh, the frustration that we've been dealing with ever since the property in our residential neighborhood uh, was purchased in March and has turned into a full-time uh, Airbnb, and uh, it feels like uh, we live very close to a mini hotel. And the situation is unique because the a property I'm talking about has... Um, has a rooftop deck and uh, we're here somewhat on a hillside and uh, it's basically we're dealing with new uh, people every couple of days that basically watch us and our neighbors and our children every day and it's become an issue uh, not only because uh, of of them watching us but we've had numerous instances where uh, people have made fun of our children and uh, I've had my six and nine-year-old daughter come inside uh, uncomfortable and feeling unsafe, not wanting to play outside anymore. I've had my family uh, come inside and not being able to spend time in the backyard because uh, there was uh, a a strong smell of uh, uh, smoke of cigarettes and pot in our backyard. We've had instances of parties uh, going on all night. uh, And uh, I've had to deal with, uh, you know, me being at work and working 48 hour shift work with uh, uh, having my wife calling in tears and uh, telling me situations where she doesn't feel safe at our home anymore. And she's afraid uh, that the party, you know, in our neighbor's backyard gets out of control. And it's been very frustrating. And I would like to express that. And I would like to, uh, I would like you to revisit the, the laws and regulations of the, <clears throat> of the Airbnbs currently, because I do feel there's uh, quite a few loopholes in, in these regulations, uh, especially uh, one, the one that we're dealing with, the person that purchased the home lives in Boulder, works in Boulder, uh, and purchased this uh, property as, a, as an investment only, it seems. And uh, per Longmont law, uh, in order to do a short-term rental, you have to live there 180 days a year. Uh, but uh, uh, who, who can prove that that person lives or doesn't live there? 
uh, half the year. Uh, I have, I, 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 I'd like to quote um, uh, Don Hermson from, from the co Code Enforcement Department and, and quote, he said, uh, unfortunately, this is one of the most unenforceable sections of our code as we would have to prove that he spends more than 180 days of the permit term not staying at the property before we could do anything, which is not something we have any capability uh, to monitor. End of quote. So basically, that, that law that you have to stay at the house 180 days a year is pretty much, um, you know, it's, it's easily bypassed. And then and, and, uh, he also mentioned that uh, the person uh, who purchased the property uh, mentioned that, well, if he decides to not live there for the next 180 days, after renting it out short term, he could just uh, put his mom on the title as a co-owner, and then he could again, and she lives in Longmont, and then again she could rent out the, uh, they could rent out the property along short term, which does clearly some loopholes. And I would like you to reconsider uh, these uh, laws and regulations in order to protect the the neighborhoods and the residential neighborhoods uh, and and their feel and um, uh, characteristics. Uh, All right. Thank you very much. Th thank you, sir. All right. Next. Mayor, we have one last guest. Uh, your phone number ends in 370. I've just unmuted you. If you could sp uh, please state your name and your address for the record. Caller 370, do you hear me? Hello? All right, if you're actually on the line, why don't you go ahead and come in? You're the last one left. Uh, no, that was the last guest that I put back in the waiting room. That uh, ah. caller has already spoken. When people okay. are done, I put them back in the waiting room, and I, I hope that they just hang up on their own. If I remove someone, they can't come back into the meeting. Got it. Okay, cool. Then we're done. That's it for first call public invited to be heard. Let's move on to consent agenda. Don, can you go ahead and read it for us? Please. Yes, I can. Mayor, item 8A is Ordinance 2020-25, a bill for an ordinance making additional appropriations for expenses and liabilities of the City of Longmont for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2020, public hearing and second reading scheduled for June 16, 2020. 8B is Resolution 2020-44, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the City and Boulder County for the 2020 financial and housing counseling program funding through the Community Development Block Grant Program. 8C is resolution 2020-45, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and Boulder County for parenting education services. 8D is resolution 2020-46, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the fiber use license intergovernmental agreement between the city of Longmont and Platte River Power Authority. 8E is resolution 2020-47, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and state of Colorado Department of Transportation for design of the Kaufman Street Busway. 8F is resolution 2020-48, a resolution of the Longmont City Council approving the collaborative water efficient landscape grant program intergovernmental agreement between the city of Longmont and the Na Northern Colorado Water Conservancy District. And 8G is resolution 2020-49, a resolution of the Longmont City Council authorizing loans from fund balance in the city's fleet fund to the DDA construction fund and the DDA arts and entertainment fund providing for repayment of the loans from the DDA tax increment income fund. All right, do we have a motion to pass the consent agenda? Councilmember Christensen? Um, I would like to pay uh, pull uh, number F just for uh, a comment. Would you like to make a motion? And uh, Councilmember Martin, do you want to pull anything? No, but I'll move the consent agenda uh, except for F. I'll second. second that. All right, it's been moved by Councilmember Martin and seconded by Councilmember Waters. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, the consent agenda minus F has been approved and passes unanimously. 
All right, let's move on to ordinances on second reading and public hearings. Uh, same rules um, for the public. If you would like to call, if you're going to be saying anything for anything on the agenda during the second reading uh, portion, please call in now. Uh, again, the number is 669-900-6833. And uh, the idea code is popping up on our screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and, uh, oops, hold on a second. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read it while we get ready. And so uh, for any public wishing to speak on any of these three items on public hearing, again, please call in now. Um, when I am ready to hear public comment on each item, I'll ask callers to hit star nine on their phones to raise their hands to speak on that item. And we'll then call on you to speak based on the last three digits of your phone number. I won't do that, but uh, Don or Susan will. Each speaker, again, will state their name and address for the record and will be allowed no more than three minutes to speak. So let's go ahead and start with 9A, Ordinance 2020-24, a bill for an ordinance authorizing the city of Longmont to amend the leases for Vance Brand Municipal Airport hangar parcels, known as Elite Aviation F FBO hangar parcels one and two, and Elite Aviation FBO hangar parcel number four. Um, is there a staff report on this item, Harold? No, correct? I can't hear you or see at this time, Harold. You'll have to say something into your mic. Harold, there's not. I mean, Mayor, there's right. not. Perfect. All right. Any questions or comments from council on this item? All right. Seeing none, let's go ahead and open the public hearing on ordinance 2020-24. Is there a caller, Don? Mayor, this is Susan. No, I do, do not see anyone that has called in yet. All right. Thanks, Susan. All right. Then in that, in that case, we're going to go ahead and close the public hearing. Can we have a motion pertaining to ordinance 2020-24? I'll move approval. All right. It's been moved by uh, Councilmember Waters and it's been seconded by Councilmember Peck. Right, Councilmember Peck? Is that what that hand was for? Yes. Okay. Okay. All right. All in favor, say aye. 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 Say nay. All right. Ordinance 2020-24 ordinance passes unanimously. Moving on to uh, item... Uh, 9B, public hearing on 2020-24 Regional Consolidated Plan and Longmont's 2020 Community Development Block Grant or CDBG Program Action Plan. Are there any questions from council on this? Councilmember Christensen? Uh, it's not a question. It's just uh, I'm very much in support of this. I'd just like to remind the public how really important this is, even though we are uh, contributing $200,000 to help businesses um, from this fund this year, which is a lot of money, but it's also very necessary right now. However, for the most part, what this does, what the Community Development Block Grant does is a lot of counseling to help people buy homes, stay in homes, get homes, there's nothing more important to the average working person than actually owning a home. It's two thirds of most people's wealth. And so um, it's really important to counsel people and let them not get into something they can't afford and also help them when they are, if they should get in trouble, but also just help them develop uh, budgeting and um, sensible practices and understand what they can afford. And that's exactly what this program does. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful um, resource that people have in Longmont. So I, I'm very much for this. And um, that's all I got to say right now. Thank you. All right. Uh, is there a presentation, Harold? Kathy, do you want to go ahead with that? Sure. If they want to bring up the presentation. Um, <clears throat> So this is for um, the 2020 through 2024 consolidated plan. Every five years, um, HUD requires that we do an analysis of the housing community and economic development needs in the community. And then that um, we set strategic goals and um, strategic direction. And then that informs how we spend each year's CDBG funds, home funds when we get that, um, and we use it a lot to direct our affordable, local affordable housing funds as well. Can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> so the consortium, the Boulder Broomfield Home Consortium was formed in 2007 with the city of Boulder, Boulder County, city and county of Broomfield and Longmont. 
Um, and this brought additional funding into um, this consortium area to the tune of about 200 to 300,000 more a year <clears throat> um, since it was formed. Again, like I said, this covers 2020 through 2024. Next slide, please. So together with our consortium partners, um, we uh, did some community engagement and input. We actually started back in, gosh, I think it was August, September of last year, gathering community um, input. We had a resident survey um, designed to collect information on housing, community development, and human service needs. Um, 2,350 total people um, participated in that survey. 1,171 of which were Longmont residents. Um, and this just gives you some information on some of the breakout of the residents that did respond to the survey. Um, there was also community meetings with residents and stakeholders that were held um, where over 30 Longmont residents attended those. Um, we also had interviews with stakeholders of the agencies that work with residents um, that have low income uh, to discuss their policy and program interventions for addressing needs. And then this public comment period and this public hearing that we're holding right now, as well as several others that were held for the, the 2020 action plan in the past. Um, it is important to note that the resident survey was conducted during February and March of 2020 um, before the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. So while it isn't um, inclusive of some of the needs that have changed since then, it does address um, the short and long-term policy responses um, to the healthcare crisis, which has affected housing situations. Can we go to the next slide, please? So some of the significant findings from this community um, engagement uh, and census data and other um, data that um, collected show that um, rents have reached new heights, probably not surprising to anyone, increasing by 27% during the past five years. And right now, uh, or actually in 2018, a $57,000 income was needed to afford the median rent in Longmont. Home values were almost triple the rent increase at 64%. This is the largest increase in the consortium area was in Longmont. Residents have higher incomes than in the past. So rising rents seem to be forcing out lower income renters and new buyers um, have to be wealthier to purchase. Next slide, please. Rental vacancies are practically non-existent in Longmont and um, throughout the consortium region. The region has lost a significant um, number of privately owned affordable rentals since 2013. Um, these units are renting at higher rates, which has broadened the income brackets in which the rental gaps exist. In Longmont, half of the rental units affordably priced for households with income between 25 and 35,000 in 2013 shifted to higher income brackets by 2018. The private rental market in Longmont largely serves renters earning between 35 and 75,000. Um, a year, 66% of rental units are priced within that group's affordability range. The market does fail to adequately serve the 28% of renters earning less than 25,000 each year, even when accounting for the impact and the inclusion of subsidized housing programs. Next slide, please. Longmont has a shortage of over 2,300 rental units to serve households earning less than $25,000. This has increased from um, 1,500, I think it was the last time that we did this kind of survey. Um, there is a, a gap, a surplus of rental homes available to those with incomes 35 to 75, which accounts for the fact that lower income households are renting above what they can afford and leads to the high numbers of households earning or paying more than 30% and 50% of their income for their housing. You can go to the next slide. 53% of Longmont renters or about 7,500 households are cost burden, meaning they pay more than 30% of their income for their housing. And 25% of Longmont renters or about 3,500 households are severely cost burden, meaning they're paying more than 50% of their um, income for their housing. Next slide. Homeownership um, is virtually for the majority of renters. 
Um, about 70% of renters earn less than the amount needed to purchase a home. Um, and lower income homeowners often cannot make needed repairs with 2,500 renter or owners not af uh, cannot afford to make repairs to their home. Some of the survey results that we received, the impediments to purchasing a home um, is too much debt. Um, they can't afford a down payment um, and or um, about 25% were told that they won't qualify for a loan with the housing prices. Um, around half of large families and older adults who own a home want to sell but can't afford to purchase something else in the current market. Next slide, please. Um, in addition, 12% of Longmont homeowners or 4,000 households are cost burdened. Again, that's the 30% um, of their income is going for housing, over 30%. And 8% of Longmont homeowners or about 750 households are severely cost burdened with um, paying more than 50%. Next slide. The primary housing needs um, in Longmont boil down to um, a rental gap of 2,300 units that would be affordable at or below $625 a month um, and a shortage of homes um, to purchase priced at less than $375,000. About 30% 30 30 of households with disabilities worry about rent increases to um, that their rents will increase to an unaffordable level. Um, and we also, I wanna say, got a lot of great info, information on um, from the surveys from uh, on respondents' financial stability, transportation needs, housing challenges, service needs, healthcare needs, childcare, employment, and education needs. So a lot of that information we'll be um, uh, bringing forward and making it available um, to folks. But we got a lot of great information from the survey. Um, I please. So all of this leads into preparing strategic goals for the next five year um, time period. And in the boxes on the left are the goals of the consortium as a whole. And then on the right hand side in the white is um, how Longmont would be um, addressing those st strategies. So um, increasing the amount and affordability of rental housing while preserving existing affordable rental units um, for the lowest income renters is the, the primary goal. So we would be looking at increasing the number of affordable rentals, uh, affordable at or below 50% area median income. Um, some of this could be through new construction, land banking, our inclusionary housing program obviously might feed into this um, as well. Also purchasing um, existing um, rental housing and converting it to affordable. Um, maintaining our existing affordable through refinancing and rehabilitation of units, providing rent assistance when needed. And this would feed into our um, um, COVID um, funding um, in particular. And then um, innovative things like our ADU program, if we ever get to have it, <laughs> I get time to ever work on it um, with everything else that's going on. Next slide, please. Um, the next strategic goal is to preserve existing affordable owner-occupied homes, um, keeping the home safe and ha habitable, helping owners age in place, and providing foreclosure prevention services, um, which Councilmember Christensen was talking about. So in Longmont, we would maintain our inventory via our rehab programs, and then the housing counseling and foreclosure prevention program in particular. Next slide. The third um, strategic goal is to support low moderate income home buyers and increase the supply of affordable ownership units. Again, this in Longmont would um, happen through increasing the inventory through our inclusionary housing program, continuing to provide down payment assistance, uh, housing counseling again with home buyer classes, budgeting and financial classes, and land banking as well. Next slide. The fourth goal, um, reducing homelessness within the consortium and providing services to assist in their transition into housing. Um, this will be um, in Longmont supported through the Homeless Solutions for Boulder County, um, which uh, helps to provide permanent supportive housing is one of the ways we can support those efforts um, and directing shelter, housing and services. And then of course the Human Service Agency um, funding is used to support agencies that address these issues. Next slide. 
The fifth goal is to revitalize and invest in communities to ensure that neighborhoods enjoy a high quality of life and health for their residents. So supporting and creating facilities that provide resident support. Um, this might be something like the COVID Recovery Center um, for um, uh, C CDBG CV funding. Um, and then supporting low and moderate income neighborhoods is something we've done in the past and might consider um, in the future for this five-year period. And then the next slide, the last goal, number six, increasing economic empowerment, both for residents to help them secure stable income and build wealth, as well as for businesses to provide and maintain employment for residents. So again, we look at um, assisting businesses that create or retain jobs for low moderate income residents um, and supporting programs that train um, residents for better jobs. So this again would feed into some of the, um, the COVID recovery funding as well. Next slide. So looking at the 2020 CDBG funding recommendations, and yes, this is the third time I believe that I have brought the 2020 funding recommendations to council because things keep changing. Um, February 25th was the last time you saw it and council approved the proposed use of funding, um, our regular CDBG funding, totaling $610,926 in grant money. In March, um, we had COVID strike. April 2nd, we found out our um, CDBG CV award allocation of just under $360,000. Um, we are allowed to repurpose 2020 funding um, as a result of the COVID. Um, we uh, took this time between April 2nd and now to gather data and review needs. And um, um, on May 14th, we presented these recommendations to the Housing and Human Services Advisory Board. Next slide. So what we're looking at doing is repurposing 2020, some of the 2020 CDBG funding, um, $328,388. We were... Um, going to fund housing rehab and we had a little bit in contingency funds. We are suggesting uh, repurposing this money um, for a couple of reasons. One, folks don't really want workers in their homes right now um, to um, repair their homes unless it's an emergency situation. So we have put that program in um, abeyance. I think I said this last time um, and um, are only working when there's an emergency need um, or something like that that's happening, or we could work on exterior, um, home, the exterior of the home. Um, we also have some funding that is not um, totally committed yet from 2019. So we think we're good going through 2020 um, by not allocating additional funding for the housing rehab program right now. So what we're proposing that, that those funds be used is 258,000, for individual assistance, which could include rent assistance, utilities, et cetera, um, likely through an agency like the R Center. Um, and then um, our share, Longmont share of the um, COVID Recovery Center operations um, in the amount of 70,000. So that would be the repurposing of our existing 2020 funding. And then for our new CDBG CV funding, um, 87.5 would go towards individual assistance for a, a total of 345.8 um, and 200,000 for small business assistance. Um, and then um, we are setting aside up to 20% for administration of the grant. So this column, um, the third, fourth column over, totals by activity for COVID shows the total amount that will be allocated to support COVID recovery activities, which is a total of 687,775 with the repurposed funding and the new CV funding. Um, and then the final column um, just shows how much is going 50% of that COVID money for um, individual assistance, 10% uh, for the CRC, 29% for um, small business assistance, and then it works out to be 11% for administration just from the 687.7. Next slide, please. So um, this is a public hearing um, to take comments on the consolidated plan as well as the hopefully final 2020 action plan and uh, CV plan. 
Um, so I would be more than happy to answer any questions you have about the needs or proposed goals or strategies, anything around the 2020 funding or the use of the CV funding. Um, and then after the public hearing, um, provide action. That's all I got. All right, thank you very much. Council Member Christensen. Thank you, Kathy. I think this is a, an excellent uh, presentation. Um, I uh, and I and I hope that a lot of people from the public are listening to understand how many resources we really do put into trying to get people into housing, uh, to buying their own home, which is the the only way to get out of poverty uh, for most people, and also to finding ways for the rest of the people who can't afford to buy a home to uh, get counseling and support in their um, rental uh, situation. Um, I do think it points out your, your chart of um, where the gaps are in the housing, I think points out to some issues with the inclusionary housing uh, ordinance that I think we need to uh, address, but that will have to happen later. Um, here are two handy little things that I keep hit because I'm such a nerd. Um, <laughs> this is from the American Community Survey, which is done every year. And it's part of the US Census. And it tells people how, what the median, the, it's very interesting to me. Um, <laughs> tells you what the median interest or the median, um, income is for Colorado, the median housing price and things like that. This is for, from Chaffa, which is also a little bit more granular. It gives you, it breaks it down by county. It does not unfortunately break down Boulder County. And so it, Boulder County skews high, but we're, we're part of Boulder County. But of course the incomes are look high because the city of Boulder, which is larger than any other city, skews everything a little higher. But I personally find those, uh, those um, tools uh, helpful to understanding uh, what's going on. Anyway, um, thanks again, Kathy. I think that was a terrific um, uh, presentation. Thank Patrick. you for all the hard work. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Kathy, I also appreciated this presentation and as I look at the strategy that you've outlined, it's very similar to Habitat for Humanity's uh, strategy for keeping people in their homes, the financing model that they go through to help them understand uh, everything about banking, foreclosures, et cetera. So, um, they, and Habitat has a, a very good record of getting people in homes and letting them stay there. So, um, thank you. I have every confidence that this is going to work. Thanks a lot. Councilmember Waters. Thanks, Mayor Bagley. Uh, Kathy, I have, I have several questions. First of all, I want to also say I appreciate your, <clears throat> your presentation, um, maybe for, for reasons in addition to what we've already heard. Uh, here are my questions. The, what you do say 30% of Longmont residents are housing burdened and 8% are heavily burdened at the 30 and 50% of, of, of their incomes. What, what were the percentages for Longmont? For Longmont, um, for homeowners, 12% are cost burdened at 30% paying uh, more than 30% of their income for housing and 8% of Longmont homeowners are severely cost burdened. So 20% of our homeowners are burdened or heavily cost burdened. 12. Oh, to, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so 20% of existing homeowners are burdened or heavily burdened. Correct. Number one, here's second question. Um, one of the shortages you mentioned in terms of the housing market were homes priced at around $375,000. Did I understand that? Yes, that's the, the amount that they used. I think that would be affordable at 80%. Yeah. 
of the area of the income at 375. That's 80% of AMI? I believe so. Because that I, was where I was going with I my question. I can find out for sure, but yes. That's, uh, it's pretty close. I mean, that's what struck me when I saw the number. That that falls into that cat in, our, in the occlusionary zoning ordinance. Homes that are market priced 80 to 100% of AMI don't have to pay the fee and you know, we've created an incentive, if you will, by not creating a, not charging a fee to encourage builders to build more of those homes because that is clearly a market need, right? There's right. A, short of, right. a shortage of homes. Um, third question, uh, and, and you probably don't want to answer this one because you'll know where I'm going with my next question. Uh, any policy that this council adopts that makes it more difficult or more expensive for people to get into homes or reduces the probability of homes market priced at $375,000 would not help you achieve your strategic goals, would it? Um, I think it would depend on what it is. Um, so yes, you're right from the standpoint of adding additional requirements to the cost of building a home obviously increases it. Um, but if there are some um, subsidies that are provided or like the inclusionary housing program where um, it's a requirement to make the fee in lieu or to build homes that are less expensive, um, that does help a certain segment of the population, but yep. it increases costs for somebody else. Sure. Absolutely. I'm not, well, I'm not, honestly, I'm not thinking in this case about people who qualify for subsidized housing. I'm thinking about people who do not qualify for subsidized housing as much as they might like to, but would also like to buy a home right. or have purchased one and they're now housing uh, in that 20% that are housing burden. Um, because, because what we are gonna do the first time we're back, council members, uh, based on, an, on a motion that was, was passed at our last meeting, we're gonna come back and a majority of this council is gonna want to eliminate the possibility possible use of metro districts as a way of financing the cost of homes. I see head shaking. No, that's exactly what we did last time. We, we, we approved bringing that back the next time we're meeting together. And when we do, when we approach that, if you would go back one more time and look at the amendments that were proposed the last time we discussed this, there were several of them that you wouldn't even consider that would help Kathy achieve the strategic objective set in this plan. Councilmember Christensen, I see you're shaking your head. No, I'd love to engage in a, uh, in a straight up debate with you tonight or any other time on this, the, the specifics of what I proposed and, and what you would see as an alternative, what you would offer as an alternative. Because we're going to approve a plan tonight with objectives and we're going to bring a plan back that, that, sub, that sabotages the very objectives that Kathy's presenting to us to achieve tonight. And, and for some reason, we don't make that connection as a council. If we care about working families and attainable housing, which the 300, so council member Adobo Faring, teachers in this community who would like to buy homes, when we come back to that other, it fit right into this category, when we come back to that other item, voting to eliminate that, uh, that opportunity is, is contrary to the interest of the very families who I've heard you talk about wanting to support. So, I'm all, Kathy, I think you've done a fine job with this for all kinds of reasons. One of them is you make the strongest case in this report for why we need to be so much more thoughtful and reflective when we approach the other issue, and that is how we support the financing of homes that would reduce costs, not raise costs, which is what we're proposed to do. By the way, Council Member Peck, I believe that, that Habitat for Humanity supports the use of metro districts when done properly, properly regulated, especially if you can bring the land conservancy into the mix. But we're eliminating all those options if we, if we do what I think a majority of this council intends to do when we bring that item back. So Kathy, thanks for your report. We're gonna revisit um, this item obviously pretty um, soon. I'm gonna call a point of order right. and let's push this discussion off until until we come back on, I know that I'm seeing heads shaking and uh, we could, we could literally go down a rabbit hole right now and be here till one, but let's, no, let's go ahead. When, when, when we, when we're asking the count, when we're asking the community to pay close attention 
I want the community to pay close I, I, attention. I, I, and we, we will be discussing, the community needs to know, we will be discussing this at the first regular session when we come back. Or no, no, we're not. You guys voted no. on that. That's true. Harold, no. when are we going to be discussing this? It failed. The vote failed. Okay. Do we have it on the calendar yet or no? That's right. It failed three to three. You're right. Does that mean we don't have to deal with that at all anymore? No, that's not what it means. Well, I, I, oh. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll talk with Harold. It's coming yep. back at some point and we'll figure that out. But for now, let's focus on public hearing on, uh, we, we've got a, we do not have a motion, but let's go ahead and open the public hearing on 2020-24 Regional Consolidated Plan, a Longmont's 2020 Community Del Development Block Grant Program Action Plan. Um, are there any callers wishing to speak on this item, Susan? Uh, no, Mayor. I did not display the, the screen, although they may have had the information previously. All right. so, we, need to display all right. the, we need to display the screen on this one since it's... Well, we, 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 uh, yeah, we, we, that's fine. We can just, we can do that, but we already they, they were instructed to call in at the very beginning. So if somebody calls in, um, we were at with the. We, I was pretty clear on the, the, that we were supposed to call in and kind of be on the line for both A and B. But let's go ahead and throw it up in an abundance of caution and wait sixty seconds or so. Mayor, I'll let you know when it becomes a live screen. Okay. It just went live, so we'll give folks about a minute. While we're waiting, it just dawned on me that actually, I was going to say that I'm sitting here in my house and there's windows on all sides. I could, I could invite people to come protest during a council meeting. Be easy. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Can we get the screen back? All right, thank you. All right, do we have a motion for 2020? 20, 20, actually, let's go ahead and close the public hearing. Councilmember Christensen. Uh, I would move, well, this is a public hearing. It no, doesn't have an ordinance number. We close the hearing. Yeah, um, okay. We, so I would just move that we move this forward. Do we, do we accept the report, correct? Is that all we yeah, need to do? Yeah, accept it. Accept right. and submit to HUD. Yeah, okay. I'll second. It's been moved by Councilmember Christensen and seconded by Councilmember Hidalgo Faring that uh, the 2024, 2020-2024 Regional Consolidated Plan along with 2020 Community Development Block Grant Program Action Plan be approved and submitted to HUD. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. All right, item 9B passes unanimously. Let's move on to the item F, I believe it was, Council Member Christensen, on the consent agenda. Yes, I just, for, for the public interest, I just wanted to point out how very, very helpful this will be. It will not help the people who still think that we need to make Longmont look like I, Ohio or New Jersey, who are very beautiful, very green states because they have lots and lots of water. But Colorado is geographically classified as a high plains desert, and we have to stop overwatering and this is a very good experimental program that i applaud our city for um for working on and uh, collaborating with um it will help us to um create a better environment using less water and create something that is more hardy and resilient um today i went down to get tested for covid 
which I finally could do without uh, having to have a doctor's permission um, <laughs> or pay for it. Um, and um, I, this was down in Lafayette and there's a trail adjacent to this um, between the Target and the Health Images Center. And um, it's really beautiful. It's a, it's a swamp. It's a kind of swamp that I used to hang out in when I was a little girl. And I had many, you know, we're talking about the BMX uh, trails and things like that earlier. This is the kind of swamp that every kid hangs around in and harasses the ducks and <laughs> catches frogs and stuff like that. And, but it also, I saw uh, just in a short amount of time, I saw a couple of magpies, um, a hawk, uh, something else, I don't know. And I, that was just while I was waiting for my son to get a, a chest x-ray. Um, this is a perfectly natural environment. It doesn't require any water because it is a, along a creek. That's what we can do here. And although there will be some people who won't be happy with it because it doesn't look like a golf course, golf courses are nice, but we don't need to turn everything into a golf course. This uses native... Uh, native plantings and it will be beautiful because if you go out walking around anywhere in Colorado in the mountains it's beautiful that's what we want here because it's beautiful here too so um, I just want to applaud the the city staff for doing this thank you uh, would you like to make a motion Sure, as soon as I can go get out of my ineptitude here. Um, I would move um, uh, passage of resolution 2020-48. Do I have a second? I'll second Second. That. All right, it's been moved by council member Christensen and seconded by council member Martin. Um, that's resolution 2020-48. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. All right, resolution 2020-48 passes unanimously. All right, let's move on to the grand finale. Uh, general business, commercial benchmarking program overview. Harold? That one is going to be um, David Hornbacher and his group. David? Harold, one moment. David, you're unmuted. Ann, are you doing this? Um, Dave, Dave was going to. Um, no, sorry here. about that. <laughs> um, uh, good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. I'm Dave Horn. Hey, David, can you uh, turn your uh, video on? There, sorry about that. Uh, so good evening, Mayor Bagley and members of City Council. Tonight, we're going to provide you with an overview on a commercial, sort of the beginning of a commercial benchmarking program. And so with me tonight, we have Ann Lutz and we have Debbie Seidman. And uh, Debbie will be doing the uh, PowerPoint presentation. All right, good evening. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Debbie Seidman, and I'm here to introduce you to building benchmarking. I'm relatively new to Longmont. Um, I work for Longmont Power and Communications. I've been here for four months. So I'm actually very pleased to be working for the city. Um, I do work in the energy strategy and solutions group. Um, in my current role, I'm looking at strategies for saving energy, and this is to support Longmont's renewable energy goals. Uh, currently, 
We are developing a building benchmarking program. So I'm here to introduce you to building benchmarking and then explain more about it. Um, my background um, includes HVAC engineering, building systems. I've been a facilities project manager. I've worked with high-tech buildings. I've worked on data centers all over the world. And um, I've also worked in the utility industry. <clears throat> So I do want to clarify that there is no action required for city council this evening. This is only for informational purposes. Just want to give, just want to provide information. Um, we would come back to council before we did have any um, launch of a program. And <clears throat> related to this, next month there will be a city council presentation about a program called Partners in Energy, and that program um, will require action from city council. Um, next slide, please. So this is a slide that I believe you have seen. If not, you will be seeing it again um, often. As you know, City Council passed a resolution for 100% renewable energy by 2030. Um, next slide, please. To get there, we have a set of seven systems or seven. Uh, we have a, an integrative set of uh, we have an integrative set of systems that will work together to help us get closer to that goal. Um, and of these seven elements, um, tonight we're going to focus on one of those, which is the built environment. Um, specifically, we are trying to save energy and the more energy you save, the easier it is to get to that renewable energy goal. Next slide, please. So the agenda for this evening is to explain what benchmarking is, I'd like to share actions being taken at other communities, how would a building owner benchmark their building? What are benefits to benchmarking? And then current actions that we in Longmont are taking to develop such a program. Next slide, please. So what is building benchmarking? Um, by definition, benchmarking is a measurement or a rating relative to a standard baseline, uh, typically an average and um, in this scenario, it's a rating relative to similar type buildings. It is a rating of energy use. The basis or the way you would gather information to determine this rating is to track energy use or energy consumption over time. Uh, click please. Uh, the purpose, as I mentioned, is to reduce energy consumption. Um, click please. Now, um, we will be using a program a software program and out of that and out of the entire um, program that I'm presenting, a building owner would receive a building energy score. So way to think about this is you're all familiar with fuel efficiency ratings. Cars have a mile per gallon rating. And if you are, for example, looking to purchase a new vehicle, you may compare multiple vehicles and one of the factors you might consider for your purchase is miles per gallon. So similarly, we can get a building score or an inefficiency score. Um, this is an example of a building with an energy score of 71. And this is on a scale of one to 100. And um, the intent of this is um, the old adage of you can't manage what you don't measure. So the intent is to really develop some awareness as to how your building performs relative to other buildings. Um, of course, we do already have other existing energy conservation programs um, but through benchmarking, owners become aware of their building energy use, and it has been shown they take measures to improve their score. Um, now, what impacts this number or this score? So there's many things. It's how efficient your home is. I'm sorry, how efficient your building is. So what type of windows you have, um, maybe the ceiling around the windows, insulation, maybe your heating equipment or cooling equipment. Another big factor now is number of computers in the building and how well those work. Um, next slide, please. So what is being done locally and nationally? Well, nationally, there are 34 cities in the US and three states that have a benchmarking requirement or an ordinance. Uh, now locally, Denver, uh, next, uh, click please. Um, Fort Collins has an ordinance. Denver has an ordinance and click please. Boulder also has an ordinance. To give you some examples on this, um, click please. Here is a municipal building in Boulder. It is benchmarked and has a rating of 60. Um, click please. 
Here is another building. It's the Student Union at University of Colorado. It is not currently benchmarked, but it was benchmarked as far back as 2005 when it had a rating of 92. Um, although Boulder has an ordinance, the university is on state property, so it currently is not required to benchmark. Um, I'd like to emphasize that 50, again, is average on a scale of 1 to 100. Better than 50 is greater than average. Our intent is really uh, not so much that a number is good or bad. Our intent really is more that this be a useful tool, and regardless of what number you're is, you may wish to take action to improve your, improve your rating and to improve your number. Uh, next slide, please. So how would a building owner benchmark? And initially, um, we would be focusing on large commercial customers for such a program. And EPA has a software called Energy Star Portfolio Manager. We would use that software. Um, <clears throat> over 40% of real estate um, customers uh, typically use this software, have been using the software. It's now expanding to other types of building segments. But this software, um, click please. Uh, there's no charge and it is a secure software. Um, click please. Um, so to benchmark, information needs to be input into Energy Star Portfolio Manager. This needs to be done by the building owner. It is self-reported. We can help them get information, um, but they do need to input the information themselves. And um, yes, click please. Thank you. Um, a building owner would need to input 12 months of utility bill data into the software, and this would be both electrical energy consumption and natural gas consumption. Building types, such as is it an office building, is it a hospital, is it a warehouse, et cetera. Gross square feet and additional basic data, which varies based on your building type, um, but typically this is number of occupants, number of computers, and a few uh, small measures. So um, out of the software, you would receive a score. This shows an example of a building that has a score of 86. So click please. And again, click please. This is, a, as I mentioned, a scale on um, a one to 100. So um, I'd like to indicate that the software itself doesn't save the energy. Again, it's getting awareness. You get a score and building owners typically, or, or it's shown a lot of, where cities have done this, a lot of cities, a lot of building owners have followed up um, with additional measures to save energy. And examples of that could be modifying operations in your building, um, could be some basic maintenance, uh, could be modifying your controls, uh, retro commissioning, and, or maybe some larger measures. Um, I should also mention that buildings with a score of 75 or greater are eligible to become an Energy Star rated building. That does take some additional paperwork or it takes some official paperwork. Um, but um, many companies such as Target and Kroger, for example, a large percent of their portfolio are actually Energy Star rated buildings. You can think of this then, uh, most people are familiar with an Energy Star appliance. In that case, it could be an Energy Star building. That is strictly optional. We are only looking at actually achieving a number, not necessarily becoming an Energy Star rated building. Um, um, you can also get a lot of input or a lot of output out of the software. So in addition to a score, you can get a lot of use information for your building. You can also get greenhouse gas emissions information out of the software. Um, next slide, please. So what are the building, uh, the benefits for building owners and for the community? Well, as I mentioned, um, the intent is to save energy. Of course, if you're saving energy, you would save cost. Um, there's marketing advantages. Building owners can differentiate their building in the marketplace, hence that's why a lot of real estate um, property managers do use this program already. Um, a potential tenant looking at a building may, or looking to lease the space, may want a higher rating, knowing that their utility bills would be lower. Also, business owners can help use this to attract or retain um, potential employees because there is a segment of the employees that are interested in working for an employer that would have this type of interest. Um, also, uh, there's operational improvements. You can get data from this program that lets you uh, see that you've got issues with your building that you otherwise did not know you had. Um, you can prioritize projects. So you may have two projects you're looking at and you can look at some historical data uh, for past projects or projects that other building owners have done, and that could help you to determine what project would be good to implement. Um, future tracking, 
um, back please. Future tracking is another benefit. So this can give you information year over year or multiple years. In addition to just comparing your building to other buildings, it's also um, looking at similar climate. So it takes anomalies due to the climate out of the number. So you can compare buildings to buildings, whether it's a hot year or cold year, warmer climate, cooler climate. Um, it gives you an apples to apples rating. Um, next slide, please. So additional benefits for the community as a whole. Um, this does um, show that there's an estimated savings um, for cities that have participated in this program, not just building owners, but cities as a whole have seen a 2.4% annual savings, which is the same as 7% over three years. And again, I'd like to emphasize, it's not just getting a benchmarking number, but taking additional actions to save energy in your building. Um, and to put this in perspective, this 2.4% for Longmont, 79% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from energy use in buildings. And of that energy use, um, the most effective way to save energy is to work with our commercial customers, at least to start this program. Um, so only 7% of the electrical customers in Longmont are commercial customers, yet um, that 7% uses almost half of the energy. So if we work with our commercial customers, we have the potential for the greatest impact. Um, we can get a lot of savings by working with a smaller number of customers and that really um, gives us the greatest bang for the buck, so to speak. Um, click please. Um, again, another benefit is this does support city council resolution for 100% renewable by 2030. And uh, click please. This also supports other programs in the city such as work being done by the Climate Action Task Force, and it ties into objectives with the sustainability plan. Um, next slide, please. So next steps for the program, um, click please. We are developing a program and the approach to that program, uh, click please. Currently, we are working on a demonstration project that is in this year, 2020, uh, click please. That will include 12 to 15 buildings. We are um, benchmarking nine municipal buildings and then we will add commercial customers, 20,000 square feet and larger. And a lot of this is to get feedback on um, overall what um, building owners think of the process. And then also um, it's process related, not so much the numbers coming out, but what worked well, what didn't work well. Um, we'll be working with some key accounts and large commercial customers in this exploratory phase. Um, and if that phase is successful, we would like to come back um, and look at increasing the program to include more buildings. Um, so um, um, click please. Um, again, we would come back to city council with any updates or additional recommendations after we complete our demonstration project and additional development. Thank you. All right, thank you. Susan, can we have the screen back? Cool. All right, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, so what I wanna know uh, is just out of curiosity, have you looked at something that Portland's doing? Which, uh, yes. Uh, the, uh, installing the turbines in the water pipes for electricity? That I have not looked at. Um, Portland does have uh, one of the more established benchmarking programs. So I am familiar with that and they're looking at some other um, equity type measures. But um, you see turbines in? in? In the city water pipes to uh, create free electricity. They're basically using the water that goes through the, through the pipes to create electricity. No, I'm not familiar with that. That's really interesting. I've actually done a lot of research into um, in previous positions in hydropower and a lot of small scale and run of the river hydro. So um, mm -hmm. this looks very interesting. This sounds Thank really you. interesting. I don't know if our, if we're aware of that, but that would be worth looking into. Would you yes. mind if I sent you some uh, literature on it? Oh, please do. And I can share that with Dave Hornbacher. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You may have Thank some you. awareness of that. I've also looked at that uh, at my last place of 
of work uh, because we did have quite a few lines that had significant elevation drops. And so any place that you were looking to dissipate energy was a potential for that. And so especially in areas where you have a lot of great changes, uh, here in Longmont, we'd have to look at that very carefully since we're a little bit flatter. And so we tend to try to minimize our pumping. Oh, okay. To, you know, create the pressure and then uh, let the system utilize the pressure. But would love to see what information you have. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Christensen. Um, I want to thank you. I think this is a very good report and a, a good program. Um, um, I like what you said about the, you know, you can't, you can't, um, well, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> you, you, can't, you, can't, uh, you, can't, you can't change something that you don't right. You can't manage you can't what change you your behavior right. if you don't really know what's going on. Right. And that's, that's part of the problem with COVID right now is that, we don't really understand, and we're also not testing anything. Or we're we're four months late at doing the testing we should have done four months ago. But with this, um, we have the potential to learn. And as you said, commercial uh, properties really use up an enormous amount more because uh, people are there more often. People need to have more stable uh, environments than perhaps your home because everybody's using it. I was. At the, I worked at the University of Colorado and we had a uh, six story building that had been built in 1970. When I, I, many things built in the seventies were, I don't know what they were thinking. The energy was just unlimited, but uh, these had uh, jealousy windows, one single pane. It was, the whole place was awful. And what I was talking to the, the uh, Department of Sustainability or, or energy, and they have a very good Department of Energy at the university. And he said, well, that building uses $160,000 a month in utilities. A hundred, and that's just one building. The university has over a million square feet of property, uh, of, of um, buildings. So imagine how much that costs the university. And I, th I think that a lot of businesses don't really understand you know, everybody sees a little part of it, but only the accountant actually sees what they're paying for the, for the bill. And when they see that, they will realize that there are numerous things you can do to cut down on that. That's better for their business, but it's also better for the, the environment. So thank you for what you're doing to get this started. And I hope that then businesses will understand how much money they can actually save by, you know, over time planning for a few substantial changes that will actually save them an enormous amount of money. Um, I, when I found out that they were, you know, this is where my potential raise was going <laughs> to heating. Um, well, it was like working in a, working outside. I could have gotten as much done working in a tent outside in the summer and the winter. In the winter, it was freezing. In the summer, it was blisteringly hot. And uh, anyway, so this, this will be helpful for not only the businesses, but also the people who work there too, um, who it may be a decent uh, building, but there's still many, many things that technology has changed that will enable them perhaps to rethink how their, what their strategy is economically long-term in terms of, uh, of updating things in terms of their building. So thanks for initiating this. Thank you. What building was that at CU? I'm curious. Oh, it was the, um, well, and we were always the last to be considered because we were just staff and staff is like the redheaded stepchild, you know. We were, the, we were across from um, Scott Carpenter Park in the old area that used to be Witchy, right. but then became, uh, Instar was next to us. We were right. the administration building. Okay. So, so called. <laughs> okay, not on the main campus. All right. No, I'm curious. Not on the main campus. So we were in no one's mind. <laughs> right. All right. Thank you. Our own. Thanks. All right. Let's go ahead and move on. Thank you very much. 
uh, folks for that report. Let's move on to 11B, Longmont Housing Authority. Uh, resolution 2020-51, a resolution of Longmont City Council approving the intergovernmental agreement between the city and the housing authority for the city of Longmont regarding future relationship and agreement between the city and LHA. So do we have a motion? Councilmember Christensen? I would move that we appoint Harold Dominguez as executive board member of the Longmont Housing Authority. Do I have a second? We can we we can skip to well, we'll skip to B. That's fine. Let's Sorry. go. But we but sorry, Mayor, uh -huh. this is Karen Rowney here, community wanna, services director. Do you want to um, do a presentation, Karen? I want to do like eleven quick slides. There you go. Let's do eleven quick I'm slides. I'm so sad. It's so, That's all right. I'll, I promise, I promise, I'll go quickly. That's all right. Um, so, uh, so basically earlier, uh, there, are, there are obviously two actions that we are asking the city council to take uh, this evening that, um, that enhances and changes the working relationship that the city of Lama has with the Lama Housing Authority. And you know, earlier this year, Jillian Baldwin, the Lama um, Housing Authority Executive Director for one more day, um, was really the major catalyst behind um, behind this IGA um, that we'll be discussing this evening. She really guided um, in her less than two years with the Housing Authority, guided the Housing Authority through some challenging times, um, really stabilized the agency, and helped us as a city staff to understand um, that there is more work to be done. She helped stabilize things, but there is more work to be done. Um, to really have a sustainable housing authority into the into the future. So we are very sad that she is not going to be working alongside us as we uh, take on these challenges. But you know we're really grateful for the many accomplishments that Jillian has um, made and contributed in the short time that she's that she's here. So I think she's uh, in the watching the meeting, and I think Carol was gonna make just a couple of comments before I go into the meat of the presentation. Yeah, Mayor, Council, what I wanted to do is talk a little bit about the position that we're in today. Um, and it is really because of the work that Jillian's done over the last two years. Uh, she has had no easy task um, as she's moved through that time period. But to put, put it an example, when Jillian started in August, 2018, um, at that time there were 21 vacancies and about 102,000 outstanding and delinquent rents. Um, and there were 396 vouchers issued. After 19 months under Jillian's leadership, there was a 7% increase in vouchers issued, a 28% decrease in vacancies, and an 88% decrease in delinquent rents across the properties. Um, and, and so that's really just outstanding work that she's done. Um, the port financial portfolio is in more stable grounds. Um, the end of year cash totaled about 170,000. Um, and at the, it's projected to be in the neighborhood of 375, an increase of 121%. Uh, she put protocols in place to address damaged units and make them rentable. Um, and more importantly, she served multiple, multiple HUD inspections and monitorings as well as from Chaffa which is the State Division of Housing, um, and as a result made the agency stronger by revising and developing policies and procedures um, to really accomplish that. Um, she's also partnered with the city to set aside five vouchers for um, adults experiencing homelessness. Um, she's working with the, she worked with the city to offer locally funded vouchers to the same hard to house populations um, that helps folks um, exiting homelessness and into stable housing. Um, in essence, she stabilized the housing authority and made it possible to build on the foundation that we're talking about today. Um, you know, the work she, that she's done really brought many of these items to all of our attention. And when Karen talks about, you know, where we're going to go from here, it would be a much harder road had Jillian not done the heavy lifting that she did. So I just want to personally thank Jillian for, for what she's done. Um, a, a Herculean effort in many ways. And um, so Jillian, I just want you to hear from me while you're uh, going on to another adventure. I wanna thank you for what you've done because without that, 
this would be a much harder road for us as, as we move into the next phase. Thank you so much, Harold and city team. Thank you guys very much for that. I'm going to mute myself. Thank you. <laughs> Karen? Okay, Susan, if you would bring up the PowerPoint, please. No, when Karen says that, we've got a lot of work ahead of us, and you're going to see that as Karen talks yeah. through this. All right, thank you. Uh, so you can go to the next slide, Susan. So, so we're here today for, um, for really to figure out and to work on uh, the really creating a more sustainable um, business model for the Lama Housing uh, Authority. So as we mentioned, Jillian helped us to identify um, that we've, we've come a long way, but there are uh, still additional financial and operational challenges that we really need to look at to, um, you know, to make sure that uh, LHA operations um, and that it, the agency is really positioned to continue to be successful um, in many years to come, because really the housing, the Lamont Housing Authority is, is a critical housing provider, affordable housing provider in our community, and, um, and we need it to be thriving and, and successful. Next slide, please. So, um, so to, to us as staff, it made sense that, um, that the city of Lamont and the Lamont Housing Authority explore a, a stronger working relationship. Um, we, we both have visions and commitments to make sure that people in our community have um, access to uh, a variety of things, but certainly uh, access to housing and shelter so that um, so they can um, thrive, all residents can thrive in the community. Next slide. Which is also the Housing Authority's vision. So, uh, so working together, next slide, please, is that um, earlier this year, we came together with the um, Housing Authority staff and city staff and really talked about a, a vision for really having a, a model of working together that leverages all of our human resources, our financial resources, so that we can ensure a continuum of housing opportunities for all of our community members who, um, who are in need of affordable housing. So um, I think the, the city and the housing authority have both have histories of working together, being efficient and effective, and, um, and we're really excited about the opportunity to create um, a sustainable operational and financial model that we hope maybe could be replicated um, with other communities throughout the throughout the state and, and country. Next slide, please. So these are the kinds of things that, the, that we discovered, again, with Jillian's assistance um, earlier this year, that, um, that we really need to continue to work on in, in the next uh, several months and years to come. And it has to do with really expanding our financial uh, capacity and staff capacity at the Lama Housing Authority. Um, addressing what we call some of the um, challenges. And when we talk about culture, it's, it's really about how, how we do business around here, not just what it is that we're here to do, but the way in which we approach that. And we've identified some areas that we can enhance uh, that organizationally, as well as within our residential communities within the, the LHA um, portfolio. The LHA board, I think earlier, um, I think it must have been last year, did start to work on a, a vision and strategy, and we believe it's really important to take that work to the uh, to the next step. We also want to pursue ongoing development um, opportunities as well as expansion of um, housing choice vouchers, so that um, so that we can continue to grow and offer additional affordable housing opportunities to, um, to members of our community but we really need to kind of change the way we do business in order to pursue those opportunities. And then I think last, what it really provides us with an opportunity to integrate the work that we're doing as a city with affordable housing goals with, um, with the Longmont um, Housing Authority goals. Next slide, please. So we've identified some um, immediate actions some intermediate actions, as well as some longer term strategies uh, to, uh, to work on in, in the coming months. So these next two slides really just in the high level identify the immediate actions, which really has to do with 
um, first kind of shoring up some of the operations at, at the Lamont Housing Authority in terms of staff training, making sure we have um, all the protocols in place that we need. There is, I think as Harold talked about, the multitude of, uh, of uh, site visits that we had and just to make sure that we are in compliance with um, all of the regulations um, that are required of our various uh, funders and to really study and look at what are the optimum staffing levels to be able to operate the Lamont Housing Authority. Next slide, please. Plus, some um, of the media actions will involve, um, you know, financial stability and just really um, making to continue to make sure that fees are being collected um, and to really have an overall analysis and review of our, our budgets, the financial systems, and just making sure that we are as strong as we can be in, um, in our financial area. Next slide, please. So this is our initial timeline for, um, for accomplishing this work. And so uh, we, we started this right before we had a pandemic. So we got sideways a little bit, but we are now back on, on track. We hope to, in the next three to six months, address the um, immediate needs and start to look at what could a new operational model be for the Lamont Housing Authority that helps us meet some of the um, goals that we had identified. So we have an anticipated um, possibly a, a 36 month um, time frame here, but that was our best guess at that point in time. But what we do know is that the next six months are really critical for addressing some of the immediate needs that Jillian helped us to understand and to start and to really try to identify what a new operational model um, can look like. Next slide, please. So why we're here tonight, um, there are uh, two things. One attached in uh, that's included in your packet is, is a proposed um, IGA that outlines the immediate work that needs to happen um, within the, uh, within the, the the Lamont Housing Authority. So we've identified that. We also imagine that there will be additional more specific service agreements that will be taking place between the Housing Authority and, and the City of Longmont. But this IGA that you have before you this evening gets the ball rolling, gets us started with our, our work with more um, specificity to come. So we're asking for the, the, the council to consider um, the resolution so that we can um, get started with our work. The second thing is, um, and this is really uh, what the Lamont Housing Authority uh, addressed in, um, in their board meeting today, which was a, a change to its, its bylaws. Um, so one of the things that the, the Housing Authority and the City of Longmont, our, our legal teams both uh, looked at and really advocated that um, within at least this, these uh, first several months is that we need to make sure that while we're exploring, discovering, figuring out how we can best work together, that both the LHA and the City of Longmont need to remain separate and independent entities. Um, and, and not take on the liabilities of the other. And so um, in order to be able to do that, it required a, a change to the bylaws for the um, Lamont Housing Authority that, um, that in essence adds a, um, an executive board member to the Lamont Housing Authority board um, that will basically share and have the same authority as uh, as what the Lamont Housing Authority Executive Director would have. What's a little bit different than um, what it says in your, it lists on your agenda, which says to um, appoint Harold Dominguez as, as the executive member of the Lamont Housing Authority Board. Uh, we really need to modify that. This was a kind of a last minute change to the, um, to the bylaws with the Housing Authority is that what we're asking is for the city council to appoint Harold Dominguez as uh, to the Lamont Housing Board, and then the Lamont Housing Authority Board would then in turn um, be responsible for 
selecting or um, or electing the executive board member, um, which we would intend that to be Harold Harold Dominguez. So, um, I think next next slide, Susan. I think that's my last slide. Um, so again. What this would do is to keep the two organizations separate, maintain independence, as I talked about before, with each um, entity being responsible for their own liabilities as we really continue to figure out what is the longer term sustainable operational model for the Lamont Housing Authority. So that is that concludes my comments. And Harold, Kathy Fendler, Karen Roney would be glad to answer any questions that you might have. All right, Councilmember Peck. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. Um, Karen or Harold, can you tell me, we have a lot of different boards on, in, in our uh, different organizations. Some of them are advisory, some of them are commissioners, some of them make decisions. Can you tell me what the role of the Longmont Housing Authority Board is for the state statute or um, for the city? What, what is the role of that board? So maybe, um, so in, I, I would invite Kathy or Harold maybe to talk about that. Um, or Eugene. It, it really, or Eugene. <laughs> so, so, um, so anyone that would love to answer that correctly for Council Member Peck would be fabulous. I'd be happy to take a shot at it. Uh, Mayor and Council, Eugene May, City Attorney. Uh, so the Longmont Housing Authority is a statutory entity under state statute. Uh, the statute vests the board with governance um, responsibilities for the housing authority. And so that's not to be confused with charter boards and commissions, which are advisory to city council. This is a board that is vested with authority to govern an independent um, public entity known as housing authorities created by statute. Okay, so they, they actually have the ability to make decisions for LAJ. Correct. Thank you. All right, we've got a motion, but I'm gonna rule the motion out of order and ask for a motion on resolution 2020-51 before we vote on that next motion. And 2020-51 is, is approving the resolution of the Longmont City uh, Council uh, to uh, basically merge LHA and the City city Council. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez. Thank you, Mayor Bagley. I move approval of uh, resolution 2020-51. Second. Second. All right, it's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Rodriguez, seconded by Councilmember Peck. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed say nay. All right, that passes unanimously. Now, we can deal with the motion appointing Harold Dominguez as executive board member of the Longmont Housing Authority. And that was made by, I think, Councilmember Christensen. Yes, I jumped the gun a little. And as Karen has clarified that, it is not to elect him as the executive board member, but to elect him to the board of the Longmont Housing Authority. And we presume that they will then um, appoint him as the executive board member. I, I, Karen, but, is that true? Or I thought we were appointing him as the executive board member because we now. You are. Um, which is it? You are appointing me to the board. Right. And then because of the legal components that Eugene, ta that Karen talked about. The right. board will appoint me as the executive. But it's all happening right now. Part of it's happening now and part of it's going to happen tomorrow. Based okay. On all right. I got it. Okay. All right. Councilor Christensen, go ahead and restate that motion. <laughs> um, okay. Because they, just to clarify, Brian, um, they, they changed their bylaws to add that position of executive board member today or this morning. Um, so I would move that uh, this body appoint Harold Dominguez as a member of the Longmont Housing Authority Board. I'll second that. Second. All right, it's been moved by Council Member Christensen to appoint Harold Dominguez as a board member of the Longmont Housing Authority. 
and it's been seconded by council member Hidalgo Faring. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Congratulations, Harold. You've been appointed unanimously. <laughs> All right, let's move on to final call. Public invited to be heard. Let's go ahead and take a three minute break. Well, we'll let people call in. All right, is everybody back? Do we have anybody in the, in the queue? No, Mayor. All right, that's it for final call public invited to be heard. Let's move on to Mayor and Council comments. Council Member Christensen. Um, I hope Jillian Baldwin is still here. I don't see her, but anyway. Um, Jillian Baldwin came here from Gary, Indiana, where she had managed a very difficult situation. And um, she knew this was not gonna be easy, but she had no idea how difficult it was gonna be. <laughs> and she really, really worked so incredibly hard. And she's so, she's so intelligent and skilled and has a wonderful sense of humor. In a, aside from being pretty and funny, <laughs> very funny. Uh, I don't think if she had, didn't have such a good sense of humor, she would have probably hung herself quite a 
welcome. But she really uh, helped straighten out a huge mess. And um, I want to thank her and wish her really well from now on and thank her for what she's done for this city. She's done more than people will ever know who, who are not familiar with the situation at Longmont Housing Authority. So I just wanted to publicly thank her as well as Harold, who really does understand it. And Director Roney understands the help that Longmont Housing Authority needs. Anyway, thank you and uh, everybody stay patient, stay strong, we wear your masks, wash your hands, and we'll all be able to move back into reality pretty soon. So thank you. All right, anybody else? All right, uh, city manager, Harold, any comments? Um, yeah, mayor and council, I do have a couple of, a quick comment. Um, one of the things I wanted to say, um, as we take this step in the work with the housing authority, um, and you know, there's never a good time for this. Um, and this is an even more challenging time based on everything that we have going on. And so as we think about the future, one of the things um, that I wanted to, to, to talk about and just, you know, so you all can start contemplating this is that when we deal with uh, the pandemic issue and the recovery, and we deal with the budget issues that are going to be associated with that, and then we take on this as the housing authority and we're still closing out flood recovery issues. Those are some of the most significant issues any organization can deal with. And so as we look to the future, I would just um, like to, to say, if we can think about those as other things are coming, I think that would help us um, because there's just a lot of work ahead of us and for really critical issues that mean a lot to the community. No more comments. All right, great. So I'm eating cheese. I thought it was on mute. Sorry. All right, uh, Eugene. No comments, Mayor. All right. We have a motion to adjourn. I move adjournment. All right. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Going home. All right. The ayes have it. Till next time, guys. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.